Ya. There it is. Okay. I want to first thank you again for, for being so patient as we're dealing with these uh, technical issues. Um, but it's it's a beautiful day and thank you for, for sticking with us. Um, just a reminder, certainly on September 3rd, we have the next panel, the, our panel, which will be the scholars with uh, Josie Mendez Negrete, um, Stephen Pitti, uh, Alejandro Jara, Arturo, Arturo Villarreal um, for September um, 3rd. So I hope you're able to uh, join us for that panel. I also just want to let you know that um, in our traditional sense, many of you attend, but we have the Day of the Dead exhibit that we'll be, uh, we will be hosting. So as soon as September 24th arrives, which is the end of the exhibit date for the East Side, we will be taking down the exhibit and transitioning to the Day of the Dead altars. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for, for the festivities. Well, this year we won't be able to do the, the reception, nor will we be doing the festival, but we will be focusing solely on the exhibit. So I, um, I hope that you will be able to join us for uh, the altars. And I think our opening date will be October 10th, for the uh, for the altars through November second, obviously, right? So we'll have um, we'll have an altar down in the children's room with the public library, in addition to the fifth floor uh, for the for the altars. And of course, I'm really excited to always transform the fifth floor during the the Day of the Dead, right? So we we I love what it is that we do in that we remove the traditional library setting into a true cultural uh, celebration. Um, it is one of the most dynamic and it's always sad to see all the colors get removed to just as lovely as books are and as lovely it is to have our students. It's sad to see it all go. <laughs> so I hope that you'll be able to join us. So um, are we getting any closer? Oh, okay. So we're getting close. So thank you very much and we'll see you all. Enjoy the program. All right, everyone. Thank you. We uh, survived the worst case scenario here, so we have another video backup. I had some uh, remarks that seem pretty lengthy now, given the time we have lost. So I'm just gonna uh, skip on all my waxing poetic about the East Side. Um, <laughs> okay, I can do a little, which is just to you know plug our exhibit, of course, which you already know about, chronicling the evolution of the East Side from mid-century farmland to modern metropolis, I would say. This exhibit focuses on the people and events that define this unique historical community and influence the national conversations around urbanization, multiculturalism, activism, et cetera. But I really wanted to note that this exhibit is by no means the final word. It's part of an ongoing effort to build archival collections that better represent not just the East Side's Mexican American community, but the rich diversity of San Jose. It is a beginning. Um, so I want to acknowledge um, the American Library Association, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Social, so, <laughs> excuse me, Social Science Research Council, whose grant funds made this panel event possible. Also the friends of the Ombudsman, Calabasas, West Valley and Willow Glen branch libraries for their donations. Uh, today with me, of course, I have Estella Inda, the mastermind behind East Side Dreams. Um, Estella's limitless energy made this exhibit a reality. Also with me, who already introduced herself, uh, Catherine Blackburn Reyes, Director of San Jose State University's Africana, Asian American, Chicano, and Native American Studies Center. Uh, with, thank you, thank you. Um, without whose help, this exhibit would be but a shadow of what it is. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy. Well, okay. <laughs> we were gonna do a land acknowledgement, Kathy. You you have it committed to memory, I'm sure. I, I, oh my goodness. I did not prepare the land acknowledgement, but um, so SJSU does have a, a standard land acknowledgement, but I will just for the bre brevity of it, we are on the land of the Muwekma, Ohlone Indians. Um, we honor the ability to be on this land and to share the land with our ancestors, um, and we are grateful that um, 
oh, we are grateful for the ancestors who took care of this land and we are shepherds of this land. We continue to care for, for this land and we must continue to make this land available for the forthcoming generation. So thank you. All right, now introducing Estella to introduce our host. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to introduce Rosanna Alvarez, co-founder of Eastside Magazine, educator, podcaster, and vice president of La Raza Historical Society. I'm just gonna cut those interests short. I loved working with Rosanna. This is one of the reasons that the Eastside exhibit, ah, better? Yes. Okay, do I need to say it all again? No, okay. <laughs> Rosanna. <laughs> Thank you, Estela. Again, can't give you enough props for what you do, even though you like standing in the corner over there. But it's a beautiful day to be here in conversation with the folks that we are going to have a, a sliver of time to uh, hear from. And there is nothing like hearing directly from people in their own voice, in their own intonation, with their full presence here. So it's an honor to be here with all the Eastsiders who were trading stories of what high school they graduated from just a second ago. Oh, <laughs> <Thomas> baby. <laughs> so we have with us Len Ramirez, a multimedia journalist and TV reporter at KPIX5 TV. Tony Alexander, the former political director for United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW Local 5, and has served in many community groups, including the African American Community Services Agency, the Allen Rock Union School District Board of Trustees. Next to me here, I have Dr. Joel Ruiz Herrera, right here, an educator who has held numerous positions in area schools, ranging from teacher to superintendent, served in community organizations, including the GI Forum and La Raza Historical Society, my favorite slash compadre comadre in the mix. Paul English currently owns a landscaping company in San Francisco. He has served in local organizations such as the Santa Clara Valley Urban League and the San Jose Chamber of Commerce. Paul is one of four sons of the Leo English, a doctor and civil rights advocate who lived on the East Side. And another one of my favorite co-conspirators here, Maritza Maldonado, founder and executive director of Amigos de Guadalupe Center for Justice and Empowerment. Also a local and national leader on issues, including immigration, school reform, and child advocacy. She was named Woman of the Year in 2022 by Senator Dave Cortese, and I'm sure we're going to hear a whole lot more with the exciting developments and the work she's doing, not just now, but in the near future. Um, and with that, folks, again, those introductions are not enough. But the opening question, and this could be a whole five-hour conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> What was it like growing up on the east side? And if you want to follow that up or maybe build on that with what was your most vivid memory of growing up on the east side? Maritza, can you go first? <laughs> Por favor. Sure, sure. So, um, buenas tardes a todos. Um, I'd, uh, so my memories of growing up in, so I grew up in Mayfair. Um, so part of um, Mayfair uh, is Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. Um, and Our Lady of Guadalupe Church was the hub of this um, social justice movement uh, and civil rights movement in the early 60s and uh, had the privilege of of um, being a parishioner there as a small child. And my mom had six kids, a good Catholic. So uh, would, we were there every Sunday, but more importantly, we were, I was able to witness um, a lot of uh, reason why I do the work that I do uh, now. Um, I think growing up in vivid memories are just the injustices that continue to plague East San Jose. Um, I remember being uh, fairly young um, and seeing the military vehicles coming through 
almost daily to tell different families in my neighborhood that the sons uh, and daughters had died in the Vietnam War. And that I remember really, really vividly. Um, and and that I started you know, thinking, well, why are they only coming to our neighborhood, right? And, and uh, so that's one vivid memory. The second is just the activism that came out of the church, Sal Alinsky, Fred Ross, uh, Father McDonald, um, you know, uh, the Kennedys, Robert Kennedy coming, coming to our church um, and his family coming with us. And, and then just uh, obviously Cesar Chavez and his work of, of organizing and how that changed the trajectory of this nation, right? When, when one voice, when one leader stood up and said, basta, enough is enough. And lastly, I think the most vivid memory in present time is COVID and what it did to our community in East San Jose. And that story needs to be in the history books because it literally, if you thought, if you thought inequities didn't exist, just look at the stats of what happened to our community. That community, um, it's personal, lost a sister um, to COVID. That was uh, our ESL teacher and citizenship teacher. And I could look around my neighborhood and look at church um, and see people that are no longer with us. So I think those stories continue to be told. Our work at Amigos is really about beating that drum and taking social action and moving policy for active change for our community in East San Jose. Thank you, Maritza. Who checking? Okay, this is working. Um, what was it like growing up in the East Side? Well, you know, one of the things that usually happens when you read books and you you see what's going on, they say, "Oh, um, you live in a ghetto." No, we don't live in a ghetto. I live in a great place. I live in a great place with with family, with friends that uh, go to school with me. We play football. We do all these other types of things. And so, uh, you know, these are my friends. This is who I grew up with. So the memories that I have is usually going out there, uh, going to school, uh, us friends, having friends that we get in trouble and do all kinds of crazy things, hanging out over there at Story and King, Story and White, you know, back there when, you know, when they have Babs milk, uh, the, the, the creamy and everything over there, you know, just going out there and doing those types of things. Sometimes uh, I didn't get an opportunity to do that, but some of the people would go to the San Jose Country Club and slide down that hill. Okay, <laughs> I didn't do any, and some of those, not a lot of those things. But the thing was is that we had great friendship, great camaraderie. Um, uh, the sports I remember when I was at Joseph George, we go to Lee Matson. Oh, those guys at Matson were crazy. No, they weren't. They're my friends. We play basketball. We do those types of things, and so those are the things that I remember growing up. Uh, going to King Little skate ring, okay. Uh, going out there and uh, and just making some of those things happen. And um, one of the other things that I I, I take a look at as far as um, you know some of the memories that uh, uh, we had. Um, everything Joseph George was new when I came there. Um, it was I think it was the second year that it was open, but all these cultures, these schools. Remember Kana. Kiriton, Linda yeah. Vista, these were crazy communities that just kind of came together. And we enjoyed figuring out how to do that. And then also going to James Lick, you know, playing the sports, football. That's right, go Comets. You know, we had uh, great com camaraderies with all of our different schools. But the thing was, was that we were the East Side. And that's what we were labeled. Okay, so to me, East Side was always cool. You know, in fact, most of the people that I knew knew that people that came from the East Side were cool because we were. <laughs> and so, you know, those are some of the type of memories that I that I had. And also too, um, you know, my father uh, came to all of our football games, all our basketball games. Every, in fact, everybody knew my dad because yeah. he was always out there doing things. And also too, he ran the boys ranch. So mm -hmm. some of my friends happened to be 
<laughs> going to the boys' ranch. Some of my relatives. Some, <laughs> some, some of his relatives. <laughs> some of my friends. But the thing was, was that they all knew my dad. They all knew that, um, you know, what we had to do is we were all together. We were all trying to make make it happen and make things go do right. So we had a great community, you know, and then some of the history of some of my friends, the Reyes family, uh, your family yeah. was out there and uh, they did some historic things uh, uh, out there with civil rights and how we all work together. So everything from the Woolworth um, picket yeah. signs that they did that I just kind of found out about when I was a little older. Okay. <laughs> so all the things when we used to happen in Story and King, the protest that we used to go out there, what's wrong with low riding? What's wrong with going out there and doing those stuff? Right? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the vivid memories that I had. Um, just making sure that, you know, this is, a, this is my family. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Tony Alexander. Yeah, listening to being a part of this exhibit, find out it's all, the east side is all interconnected. You mentioned Babs Creamery, Big murmuries, driving through, you get your bottle of milk and a glass bottle, you bring the bottles back, Sizzler across the street. And it was always family and community was very big. And I was fortunate that my parents moved here in 1952. My dad came out of the Korean War. And at the time they couldn't buy a house because they were black. So my mom had to do it all over the phone. And when she showed up, the realtor tried to back out of it. My mom was like, no, 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 no. And my dad opened up a medical practice on 17th and Julian and took care of most half the kids at uh, San Jose High. He delivered, I found out. And, you know, they talk, oh, your dad delivered me. And, oh, your dad delivered my brothers. And as a kid, I was able to make house calls with my dad back in the day when they did that. And my job was to carry his blood pressure <laughs> thing, you know, and I would hold it and he would go into the living room, like out in the Evergreen, Penitentia, um, up Milpitas, and he would, one by one, the whole family would go into the room to be taken care of. And I would sit in the living room and eat and meet all these wonderful people. But it's all very interconnected on the east side. Um, I went to Mario's barber shop. I think Estella's mom was talking. Uh, you know, she knew that. And Mario said, oh, wait a minute. You're the little kid that showed up with the doctor to take care of my mom and the family and the sisters. So there's this great sense of community. And as you were saying, it's very warm and relaxing to come back to the east side. Um, my dad did a lot with the, the civil rights. And my mom was a... Uh, one of the founding counselors at Elm Rock Counseling Center, mm -hmm. which was to help the Latino community, which was very, in the mental health department, very under under serviced. Right. And I remember going on calls with her, crisis in the middle of the night. And my job was to sit in the car and if anything happened, <laughs> call the police. Because, you know, she was going to these homes, but it turns out she would get there and these just wonderful families and community that's part of the East Side. Um, and then some of the memories, uh, Tropicana Bowling Alley, you know, we go bowling in the morning and go to uh, breakfast right after there. And my dad, we, he did move up on Mount Hamilton on Clayton Road. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I just remember looking out at night, the valley was dark. There was a lights of downtown and the green light on the top of the Bank of America yeah. building. Mm -hmm. And that was just like this beacon and there would be little streaks of the lights from the streets. Now, of course, it's all filled in Silicon Valley. But back in the day in the spring, it would turn into like a quilt of colors, just with all the apricots and the prunes and the walnut trees. Um, and we were joking about high schools. I went, I was a bell. I went to Bellarmine. Got a little moan about that, but a lot of the we forgive you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. But a lot of the kids in Bellman were from the west side. And when I'd say, Oh, I live on the east side, I would get this like, oh, you live on the east side. Yeah. But then they would come over and visit and they would be like, Wow, this is really nice. Or we go to the store and everybody be like, Oh, hey Paul, or you know, we knew each other. And uh just listening, all these stories, they're all interconnected. Um, together. So the East Side is really a special, and it's still special to come back to. Uh, my mom still, she lives over off uh, McKee and Toyon. She's 97. She didn't make it today, but 
she made sure I had on the right shirt. And, you know, it's like, you've got to look good and you got to talk. And, uh, you know, it's that community of uh, growing up in 4-H, uh, a lot of the, the agriculture. I had the goats and spending like Santa Clara County Fair. It was just special, special times. And uh, every time I come back, it still feels special to, you mentioned the rolling hills. I think the east side is the best side because we get to watch sunsets mm -hmm. yeah. over Mount Uminum. They don't get to see that. They watch the sunrise over Mount Hamilton. But uh, I think that's what makes part of it, the east side, the best side. And uh, just one last, on my dad's 90th birthday, he was a little depressed. And he was saying, oh, you know, I could have done more. I could have done this for so many people. So he, I said, what do you want, dad? What? He goes, I want tamales. <laughs> so they went to the tamale factory. And the Rodriguez used to live next door to dad. And when he went to pick them up, half the factory came out and said, you delivered me. And my mom said, my dad actually got teary eyed. And I said, there you go, dad. You can't beat what you did for everybody. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leonard, you have a comment and I'm a royal. That's and right. because uh, 6970, my senior year, we beat you guys for the other ball <laughs> top. And we're still the friends. Football championship. I'm going to let you go next. I'll go last. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very similar comments. Uh, I was born in uh, San Jose at San Jose Hospital, and uh, we lived a couple of different places on the east side. The first place uh, where we lived was over near Penitentia Creek. It was a brand new, you know, for the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, a subdivision there and for me and my brothers and sisters and all of the kids who lived in the street it was a prototypical you know 1950s 1960s uh suburban life uh kids everywhere bikes everywhere uh the parents you know never knew where we were uh, because we would be playing all day uh eating you know lunch or even dinner uh, from a, a neighbor's house and it was all good. Nobody worried about us. And, you know, we just came home at dark and sometimes not even then because we'd have big hide and go seek, you know, uh, and there was, we'd have like 50 kids. <laughs> you know, some kids were never found again. You know? <laughs> uh, so it was crazy. Um, but I like to say that I really grew up uh, at an intersectional time in San Jose's history. It's where we, the Valley of the Heart's Delight, met Silicon Valley. Mm. It was right during that time period. And, and especially on the east side where we lived, uh, there were still a lot of fruit orchards. Mm. And uh, you had sort of that rural feeling. And then you had, you know, kind of the emergence of technology. We didn't live in a ritzy area or anything. But I remember that we had, um, you know, friends whose uh, parents were engineers, uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, things like that. And we, we didn't really understand what any of that was. But we just knew it was kind of like this, you know, had to do with like the military and, you know, spy airplanes and stuff. And then we were always afraid because, yeah, he works for Lockheed, you know, and then, you know, if they nuclear war happens, they're going to bomb us first. You know, <laughs> we grew up with that kind of uh, fear. Um, but there was also the, you know, the, the hills and the creek and the trails and Allen Rock Park. And we learned a lot about nature that way. Uh, just by being out there. So, um, you know, we, it, it was almost like a Huck Finn kind of a thing. I remember my brother and I going on our bikes to Penitentia Creek and we'd get, you know, my mom's uh, broom and get a fishing line and a little hook and literally bacon or bologna. And that was our bait. And we'd go into the creek and we would fish. And I remember yeah. catching a fish like that when I was like seven or eight years old. Uh, going swimming in the percolation ponds or going swimming in the creek. Uh, you know, we always go dry and come back with our just, you know, <laughs> pants all wet and everything like that. One uh, summer, I remember we got um, little uh, frogs, little baby, or it must have been springtime, uh, you know, uh, coffee can full of uh, frogs. We brought them home because we wanted like, you know, 250 pets around the house. So that summer, there were frogs everywhere in our yard. But it was just, it was a great time to, to grow up uh, and a great place to grow up uh, where the valley meets the hills. Uh, that was our stomping grounds. And it was just a wonderful place to be. And it was almost like its own little city. I mean, uh, Alum Rock, Alum Rock Village, 
was like a little, almost like a downtown in those days or a variety of different kinds of stores. Peter's Bakery is, mm -hmm. I think, the only one that's still there, but Reed's Sports there Shop was there. there yesterday. There was, you know, the Creamery was there. Mm -hmm. James yeah. Lick was there. There was the market that was across mm -hmm. the street. Um, and just uh, many different things uh, in the east side. So you really didn't have to go to downtown unless you wanted to go shopping at, you know, JCPenney or, mm -hmm. you know, any of the department stores that were still in the downtown area and we even had our own newspaper the east san jose sun you know it was just kind of reported on you know the ball games and things like that that happened uh in our little area so it was just really kind of an idyllic place to grow up for a kid and you know i didn't worry about labels or being looked down upon or anything like that uh as i would later kind of come to realize that you know with this especially i think it was the Geraldo rivera thing when he <laughs> okay. you know was going to yeah. do something and he told national television that uh east san jose is the ghetto side of town it's like oh that hurt you know it really hurt all of us um yeah exactly exactly so he comes in from new york or wherever and later i was i was able to meet him and i said you know i'm from the ghetto side of town yeah. to you. <laughs> um Anyway, uh, just a great place to grow up as a kid. And uh, I still live on the east side. I've lived in other part, places in the valley. But uh, so I was telling Paul, you know, I, I'm kind of drawn to the hills. You know, I just love being here and looking out. And then that drive home, you know, after a, a hard day at work and you see the hills and the sunsets and all that. It's just a beautiful place to be. Still is and always will be. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back again and, and uh, say thank you to the library for bringing us together and especially to our main curator, Estela Inda. And I just want to share right now that uh, her mom and I went to Overfell all four years together. We went to go to James Lick. We went to Overfell. Tony's, Tony's here and her husband, Frank. Uh, growing up for me in Eastside was really different because uh, my dad was a Pentecostal preacher. And I wasn't allowed to hang out with other kids that weren't from the church. I did not have the Catholic experience like all my, I have 38 cousins and all of them, except me and my siblings were, were Catholic. They were Catholic. So when you talk about the Catholic experience, I have nothing to compare to that. And so we did a lot of playing outside. Like you talked about kids and bikes everywhere, all the free stuff, uh, you know, uh, marbles, uh, 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 kick the can, you know, hide and seek, uh, you know, all that stuff is what I remember playing football in the street, uh, visiting families. I didn't feel like we uh, orchards. Uh, we lived at McKee and, and uh, um, King Road area for a while. And over the back fence was a, a big wallet orchard. And we used to chase jackrabbits and do all the free stuff, you know. But I, I think it's a growing up uh, special experience because we didn't have a lot. And we were with other people that didn't have a lot. But we didn't know that we didn't have a lot. Right. We had a lot of love, a lot of frijoles and tortillas, you know? Right. You know, my. And, uh, and then they put those sacks to use after they used them. <laughs> so, uh, and she has dresses from that stuff. <laughs> My wife made her own clothes. She's sitting right here. She made her own clothes. I mean, we didn't know that we didn't have, but there was a lot of love. There was a lot of camaraderie. There was a lot of, you know, get out the house and don't come back in unless it's for number two. You know, <laughs> and, I mean, just, so that's the way you grew up with a lot of love. The bread trucks, I think, Paul, you mentioned the, the milk or something, yeah. but yeah. the bread trucks come around 20. Somebody said something about that. I just think it's a very special experience to grow up. Uh, now that I'm older and I have a, a not only a beautiful life, I have a beautiful wife. Um, I, I, I look back and I said, geez, I didn't even know that I didn't have that much. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. My life was very different. I was a ninth grader in Orfeld, and I told my friends they would think I was crazy, but I walked up to them and I'd say, please don't cuss around me because then I won't be able to hang around you because that's the way my Pentecostal preacher parents taught me. No movies, no TV. So I got into books. Thank God, right? You're looking at it. You're listening to a Madsen kid that couldn't wait to go to the library every week to read, to check out the next book. But we didn't buy books. Went to the library. Yeah. I grew up 
crying when my older brothers wouldn't go, would go to the library and they wouldn't take me. So I threw my little, I threw my little, uh, you know, and I, I got taken. So there's always an upside. How does it say? No hay mal que por bien no venga. There's nothing bad that comes that doesn't bring you some good. So I appreciate the trucks. I appreciate the milk that they used to bring. I appreciate the kids. I appreciate riding my bicycle to Alamo Park down Penitentiary Creek. I appreciate pick, uh, picking apricots. My mom, bless her heart, 95 today. She took six of us to take to cut apricots on Clayton Road. My little sister would sit in a little basket. She was that small, a clothes basket. And the five boys would sit there and cut cots. So that's the East Side experience to me, just hanging together, knowing that there's a lot of diversity and appreciating that you have nothing even though you don't have nothing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Juan. A lot of what you all are sharing resonates. I remember um, growing up in the East Side and, and driving with my mom from one part of the East Side to McCreary. And I would always wonder, right, especially because during that time in the 80s, you would see uh, there were still a lot of orchards. It was when that transition into Silicon Valley was happening. And I remember thinking, what must this have been like before? Mm -hmm. And I still do that, right? But I remember being a little kid and, and thinking that. Um, and I remember a lot of folks definitely would always come back and share their stories. So I always had this counter narrative or more realistically, this narrative that countered the counter narrative that I was getting about what the East side wasn't in my experience. So I appreciate you all circling back. You know, Some of you said you, you don't live in the East side anymore, but you come back. And I think that that's critical because um, some of our kids, what they hear is get out, right? And what does that mean? So really taking a moment to pause and ground us in that history is, is critical. But we do have a question that I am curious to hear about from each of you. When did you first begin to identify as an East Sider? And I'm not gonna have Joel Baron oh, okay. talk, but, but we'll start with, with whoever sees fit, go for it. Sorry. Uh, February 14th, 1960, I was born in San Jose Hospital. <laughs> That's when I became an East Sider. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's stamped from the beginning right yeah, there, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. Actually, for me, um, when I was in junior high, I went to Joseph George. And so um, I love to play basketball and, uh, and also run track and play football. And, um, but where I played basketball was actually at the Mayfair Center. Mm -hmm. Remember Bob Strouder? And, mm -hmm. and then uh, we had other guys, Ross Henry, Lou Henry, yes. all those guys that were principals uh, wanted to make sure that we have places to go out there and play. So I used to go to the Mayfair Center and you know where the Mayfair Center is, it's right, right across the street from Lee Matson. Mm -hmm. So even though I lived uh, in East San Jose up in the foothills, okay, I always had to go and uh, I play against all these guys that, um, I, uh, that, that I didn't know because they didn't go to my school. And so, um, you know, they would uh, say, hey, you're coming over here? Okay, well, you know, we're East Siders. I'm going, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. No, we're from the east side. So when we go and we play basketball, everyone, everyone fears us. Why? One, we're good. And then the other is, is that we're from the east side. <laughs> so uh, my first memories of, of, of saying, hey, uh, when I go out there and I play basketball or do some things with people, hey, I'm from the east side. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, again, for me, it, it's a proud moment. It always was a proud moment because, uh, uh, I played with some really good guys, <laughs> okay? And they were superstars, and I thought that I was too. So, <laughs> you are. Yeah. Anybody else here? Len, I'm curious. Yeah, um, well, like Paul, you know, I was born and raised, so I always, you know, considered myself an East Sider, but I think it really came into sharper focus for me uh, later when I attended San Jose State. I was mm. in the um, journalism program, uh, and thankfully, it just you know prepared me so well for my later career. But part of that was uh, going on the radio. Uh, this KSJS, it's a radio okay. station here at San Jose State. It uh, doesn't have a very powerful signal, um, but it's enough to reach you know the downtown area and the east side. And uh, on Friday nights, in fact, um, my sister was a part of this ahead of me a couple of years, and uh, we were part of a radio program that was targeting 
uh, Latinos and you know, kind of bilingual uh, music. And we play a lot of Chicano rock, we play rancheras, we play cumbias, we play a lot of you know, Latin music. And it was called La Cosa Nueva. And it was on the air and it had gone through several iterations over the years. And I was part of that. And uh, I, my radio shift was Friday nights. And I think it was from like 10 to midnight, something like that. And during that time, it was prime time cruising time. And uh, our station was the only place where you could get continued music uh, like that, that people we found out because we also played, we kind of morphed into like oldies towards the later part of the night to kind of cater to a lot of the people who were cruising at that time. And let me tell you, our phones would ring constantly, <laughs> constantly uh, for people asking for dedications, you know, because they were out cruising and they'd want to hear the song come on. And it was such a great way to connect with the community uh, during that time period. They would, you know, ask for songs. Somebody was breaking up. They play this special song, get them back together. <laughs> sort of almost like that Wolfman Jack thing from American Graffiti, you know, kind of that way with the community. Exactly. Yeah, we'll get you right back together. <laughs> so uh, that was really, uh, you know, a, an eye-opening experience for me. And to have that opportunity here at San Jose State, you know, as a college student and really connect with an audience, connect with an audience in a way that you can't really do it even to this day, um, because, you know, they would call up, ask for, you know, they'd, you know, you'd talk to them and then you'd spin the record. Uh, so that was a, a really great experience. And it just happened to coincide with, you know, the biggest, you know, cruising uh, situation over at Story and King during that time. It was just, mm -hmm. it was awesome. It was fun. Thank you for that. Joel, you're going to take it away now? Yes, uh, I, I thank you for this question because thinking about it, I, I start thinking like, when did I actually feel like an insider? I mean, I totally claim it now. I mean, we've lived in Tropicana and my mom is still in the storybook homes, you know, Galahad, Peter Pan, Ben Rink, all that stuff. She's still there where, where we landed when I was 11. But as far as feeling like an insider, I'm gonna connect it to my first job. At 14 years old, I was called by a family friend and, she's, and, and because I had been pining for a paycheck job, you know, like I had so many other jobs already. I had tons of jobs, I made money. I was a, I was a newspaper boy. I was the first one in the family to go to Disneyland by selling subscriptions. I was the first one in the family to get my own new bicycle by selling subscriptions, but I had that, but I wanted a paycheck job. So my friends, a family friend called me and said, Joel, you have a, a white shirt? Yes. You have a pair of black pants? Yes. Get ready for work, I'm gonna pick you up in 30 minutes. So I went to work on the west side on Lincoln Avenue. It was called Rocky's Pronto Pup. I worked there my sophomore year, my junior year, my senior year. I was a novelty and it was my first time out of the inside, you know? And people would relate to me and say, well, you're from the inside. Yes, I'm from the inside. And then in the adult years, I, I worked for Alpha Beta. I had a 15-year career as a butcher. And on the other side of town, they would say, Joel's from the inside. I mean, I didn't even know it was that special. I mean, I know it's special now, but I did. So I've always had that in my bones that, yes, I'm, in from, I'm from the inside. There's a lot of pride. Uh, many, many people in this audience today could be sitting up here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, I live his daughter. <laughs> so so uh, yes, I do. So anyway, but, but uh, there's a lot of us in this room could be sitting up here as a representative, and I know that's what I am in this moment. And I'm pleased to be here. I'm proud of the East Side. But uh, you, you all mentioned music, uh, Lynn. But when I got my first nine volt transistor radio, I was ordered by my Pentecostal preacher dad nothing but gospel music on that radio. And so I didn't get into Vicente and Ramon Ayala until I was in my 20s and I left the house, you know. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I am an East Side, but that's the first time I remember that he's from the East Side. People would come in the restaurant and say, oh, he's from the inside. They point at me. Thank you. I don't think I've ever not been an East Sider. <laughs> I think it's, it's um, you know, it has shaped my whole world of being, um, my sense of activism and, and to push for policy change for 
for folks in East San Jose, um, and it's given me uh, my culture. Um, and, mm -hmm. and also, it's a safe place for our immigrant community to come where they don't have to assimilate, um, that they can speak their own language still. Um, and it's been a welcoming place. Uh, so I will uh, continue to call myself an East Sider, uh, proud to be that, and also the importance of just uh, lifting up the resiliency of our people uh, that have uh, come before us. We stand on those shoulders of all of those people that came before us in the neighborhood where I grew up of Sal Si Puedes, get out if you can. Uh, our work is about about pulling in now and, and making, reinvesting in our community for our next generation of, of young people. I love that. Thank you so much for ending that part of the, the discussion on that note, um, that inclusivity, that community, right? That spirit of, um, you know, I think one of the experiences that epitomizes it for me was, I just think back to my teen years, and you better hope that if your car breaks down, it's in the east side because seven people will jump out of their car and get it done, right? You run out of gas, it's, it's going to happen. You'll be fine. That happens other parts of town. My experience has been it's very different. I think um, I have found myself in other parts of town just knocking on doors and nobody, right? Um, there's this, this different element of belonging. And I feel like the east side is very welcoming in that way and very much home. And will always be that for me and even my girls who didn't grow up in the east side um and i know some of you have touched on this question already because it's obvious you know in how we tell our stories what to you makes the east side the best side and i know some of you already gave us a preview you mentioned the sunsets you mentioned the lowriders you mentioned that community you mentioned that spirit of inclusivity and culture but if we can hear it one more time or maybe iterate it quite differently for somebody who needs to hear it here in this audience, what to you makes the East side the best side? I'll jump in here. I think for me, uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's the, the people, the families, uh, you know, families tend to stay on the East side and so, um, you know, you go into the grocery store and you see people from high school and it really is like a small community still in a lot of ways. And so the, the, the people, uh, the families, the people you grew up with, you know, it's great to see that, you know, kind of continuation. And then you see, you know, the, the descendants of, the, of your friends, uh, you know, in this area too. So that's, that's really one of them. The other is just the diversity of food. I mean, it's <laughs> awesome to uh, be able to go around and, and just, you know, go down the street and, you know, the tamale factory is there, you know, or you go get, you know, a Cuban sandwich at one of the, the you know, the bakeries and it's stacked like this high, you know, um, even places, you know, like antipastos. I mean, uh, there's just a diversity of, of places to go still and it is in many ways, just that small community feel uh, like I don't have to go that far to, you know, have a great meal, you know, and, and one time, you know, we had the National Hispanic University there. Mm -hmm. So there was just this range of schools, uh, opportunities, you know, high school, and then, you know, a university right here on the east side, you know, if you wanted to go there as well, then San Jose State is practically on the east side of downtown. So, <laughs> so it's there as well. So there's, I mean, there's a lot to love uh, about the east side. It's just, you know, the, the memories of, of the people, the food, and how those um, two things really, you know, are things that really make you feel, they, they really go to your heart, you know, and that is really, what um you know keeps me going on the east side because you know i'm raising my kids here and all have done uh, very well and flourish i think there's a, a, a tendency to think that well if you didn't have well, go to a privileged school that you know you, you don't have a chance in this world well, that's bs you know and i've argued with people about that over the years that you know the east side and, and I, I love this logo the east side dreams because it's really where dreamers live and and a lot of the families that are here didn't grow up with silver spoons in their mouths. They had to work for it and they had that dream and first getting here, 
you know, from wherever they happen to come from, you know, overseas, uh, over the border, across the desert, wherever. These, this is where the dreams really ferment and become something. And so for that reason, I think the East Side is a very unique and special place and always will be. Thank you for that. I don't know about you, Paul. I, I was rich when I came here or when I was here because I picked apricots and plums. <laughs> and that's right. I during the summer I have money. Okay. <laughs> and so that was one of the things that um, you take a look at. You have that opportunity to do that. I still remember mowing the lawns in the neighborhoods. Yes. And um, getting out there, like, what was it, a dollar a yard? Something like that. And um, being able to go out there and do those types of things with and 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 you know, I, I remember knocking on people's door and say, would you like me to mow your lawn? Okay. Mm -hmm. How often can you go out there in the neighborhoods and do that? Mm -hmm. And people go, yes, come on. In fact, my lawnmower's in the garage. Yeah. Go ahead and go ahead and do that. And then when you're done, put it back in and I'll pay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's one of the things, again, that uh, why I think that the East Side is the best um, <laughs> is because we have that type of family uh, uh, atmosphere. Everything from, you know, when you think about some of the families that I went to school with, um, the Takedas, who had the uh, nursery over off of Jackson Avenue, um, the Rips, who had the plumbing right there on Jackson that used everybody. Um, you know, Paul, your dad, you know, he was an institution in East Side, as again, as he delivered him and Dr. Dr. Hyatt. Dr. Hyatt. <laughs> yes, sir. those guys that were out there doing those types of things and making that happen. And so, um, you know, just that, that family camaraderie. And then, of course, uh, Joel and folks, Jim Plunkett. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Jim Plunkett came from James Luke. That's right. I never felt before that. Uh, uh, so one of the things that about that is that we have pride in some of the people that are here. Okay. We have a lot of folks that have grown up and have made it. And, uh, and folks that we don't even know about, okay? Because this East Side and, and San Jose is made of, uh, of, of a lot of people. Um, the string of people that have set up here and made things happen here. Some of the leaders that we just don't talk about that just make things happen. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, I love this community. Uh, I'm born and raised here. Yes, I was born in San Jose Hospital too. <laughs> okay. and. Um, it's just something that, um, you know, <laughs> uh, one of the things I remember too is that my dad used to take us to the San Jose State football games. And he had um, a, a Chevy Impala station wagon that we used to call the bomb. Mm -hmm. And all of my friends uh, from Joseph George, and we would go to the San Jose State games and go out there and do that. And, uh, you know, again, we did that. It was our East Side Pride that came out there and made that happen. So um, that's kind of what it is. And, you know, we have these followers we talk about from Overfelt to Lick to Mount Pleasant, mm -hmm. um, all these things, but it's a rivalry that we love because um, we are always, you know, they had something on TV the other day where I guess a young man hit, he threw a, a ball and hit the guy in the head and the kid came over and hugged him and said, it's okay. Yes. Yes. Well, we do that all the time. Okay. <laughs> We do that, we have that type of rivalry, but the rivalry is, is that we're gonna make sure that no matter what happens, we're gonna take care of each other, okay? And, you know, all the people that I know, uh, my wife, I always tease my wife, she's from Milpitas. And so uh, she always goes, why do you always hang out with these folks from East Side and they go to Independence and Piedmont and Overfell? Why do you always take care of those folks? I said, because they're from the East Side. Okay, we have this camaraderie that we go out there and we do. So that's kind of what it is. And that's one of the reasons why the East Side is the best side. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to talk about this in a sense that, you know, I believe everybody thinks they're on the best side, you know, uh, and that's good. Uh, but um, for me, I, I, I want to refer to my notes because this one really, this question really made me stop and think. And I, and I wrote down that it's special due to its diversity and the humility of its people 
and the appreciation of opportunity. And Rosanna talked here about, you know, if your car breaks down, there's 10 people to help you. Tony is talking about, you know, there's a lot of people helping each other. And it's just like on this side of town, you're going to find more first generation college, you know, going to college. So we appreciate the opportunity. And then we have the humility here. I once knew, uh, because I, I almost went into law enforcement work at uh, San Jose PD, and one of my uh, people I rode around with, he says, oh, man, I don't want to work on the, on the west side. Everybody thinks they're an attorney over there. He says, I want to work on the east side. And people are like, wait, 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 respect me, you know? I don't know if some of my relatives did, but, you know, either way. Uh, but, but I think it's special uh, because of, of what we've been through together. Paul talked about not being able to buy his parents not being able to buy a house because they were black. And in Stephen J. Pitty's book, the weird title, it's a weird title, it's called The Devil in Silicon Valley, but it's one of the few books that I like because it's focused on this guy right here, Mexican-American roots in Santa Clara Valley. That's a specific focus. And he points out how until the late 40s, it was legal. It was legal to say you cannot rent or buy over here on the west side because you're black or brown or someone we don't like. And they changed the law in the late 40s, but you know how they say they don't change the attitudes, they just change the law. And uh, this is a special place because of what we've been through together. Like I said, many of you with your lives could be here up here. I want to say my brother's name because he was a giver, J.R. Herrera. Uh, JR. 25 years he gave to a middle school as a head custodian. Right. And he did wrestling. He ran the dances. He knew those kids because of the, 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 because of the life he lived, he related to all those kids. But as educators, we would say they're on the fringes. They came for him. <coughs> My wife, Rita, gave 40 years to the Alamo School District. We're givers. In our community, we talk about how are you going to give back? This guy here, he became an officer at the American Legion. He never stopped giving. Thanksgiving, Christmas, they find needy families and they bring them food and gifts and clothes. He called me up and said, Bill, he says, there's three kids over there don't have shoes for the sports that they're playing. So he'd get us involved in giving. So I think that's what it's about. And like I said, my wife had a chance to, to leave Alamo School District and she didn't want to. She wanted to serve this community. I know I'm bragging, but I'm gonna brag. Stanford <laughs> University tried to hire her away from the Alamo School District. And she said, no, I wanna stay here in the Alamo School District on the east side. That's what makes it the best. This is what makes it the best. Thank you. So I, I have talked a lot about my own experience growing up in Mayfair, and I think it's sacred ground, and I tell people that all the time. We do a community walk, so mm -hmm. um, my nonprofit, uh, it, it Place Base Agency in East San Jose, um, every new member and every funder that wants to fund us, you need to come, and you're going to do our community walk with me because I need you to understand who we are in, in East San Jose, who we serve, and why it's important for you to walk with us on this <coughs> sacred trail that Cesar Chavez has paved for us. So um, I live in that spirit of service uh, every single day. I am just a vessel that has uh, been placed to, to continue to tell those stories of, of the injustice uh, that played plagued our community. Uh, we're worried about the gentrification that we see happening in East San Jose right now. Um, it's happening before yeah. our eyes. We saw what happened in San Francisco with the mission. And it's up to us to really start lifting up those stories and start saying to the Googles of the world, you know, please don't displace us. We're not, we're, we will not allow that to happen to our beloved East San Jose. We're a family, as many of you have, have said already, but there's something that uh, being an East Sider brings to you is this, um, this real passion of making a difference uh, for our community, 
on installing the, that difference into the next generations through education, through service, through storytelling, through, um, through walking, um, through history in, in our beloved East San Jose. And there are lots of beautiful stories uh, to share around the diversity um, there, but there's also um, a real, real fear of what we're seeing um, of the displacement of our families and gentrification. And, and we will continue to lift up those stories. We need your help to help us tell those stories uh, of why our language and our culture and the music and the beautiful restaurants that we smell and, and taste every single day are important for our communities. Thank you. Yeah, I, can I just add to that as well? Because I think uh, one of the great things about this that we're doing today is we're putting it on the record that you know we recognize that this is a special place. And because of it being a special place, there are you know special people who have come through here, uh, like has been mentioned. You know, uh, Jim Plunkett, uh, Luis Valdez. You know, they were both you know East Side people. Uh, Cesar Chavez, mm -hmm. of course, uh, and we have a living legend here, Blanca Alvarado. Blanca. Right. You know, we have very special, unique people and, and people who have taken on a leadership role in helping not only their community here locally, but, but the, really the Chicano experience, you know, everywhere and, and brought it into a positive identity and really enacted great social change. And it all started right here in East San Jose. And, and it's wonderful that we're putting that on the record that we acknowledge that. And I think that's so important especially for the kids, for the next generation to remember. I asked that Rosanna if I could say something again, because I mentioned humility, and you just listened to Maritza's humility. She says, I'm just a vessel. She is, and we all are, but I want you to know, on 53 Sharp Avenue, Cesar Chavez lived and began his work that transformed the national and international consciousness about how to treat our field workers. His home went up to sale and it was become another something because the family has been living there since he lived there in the 50s. Maritza with her new organization uh, has purchased that home, they now own it. They now own it. She had the backing of several people because they know where her heart is. And it's humble, but she wants to keep that alive. So Eastside's a special place, and she's an example of that. Thank you. Thank you for that. So much truth here, right? Um, Len, you mentioned that kind of going on record and it's like going on record for the record the people by the people for the magazine that we co-founded a lot of times we say something that we've heard from other elders out in the community it's by the people for the people about the people and um, I think when I have conversations like this with folks who have been in it and doing all of the wonderful work to keep that legacy alive and present and help us stay rooted it's a reminder, right, of, of who we are and how we get to say the whole story. Because yes, some people have said, don't you romanticize the East Side a little too much? And I'm like, no, <laughs> we don't give it enough romance, okay? <laughs> but part of it is a lot of times the stories are told a sliver or from the statistics. And what I love about the stories here is that there is so much more than just a number and a statistic, there's a story. And there's a patchwork of stories that are interconnected and will continue to stay interconnected. And so I'm thankful to be here with all of you and all of you. And with that, I invite the audience to be a part of the conversation because we do have a little bit of time for some Q&A. And I think how I'll manage it, because nobody's told me otherwise, is if you have a question, I'm gonna invite you up to the podium just so we have a visible marker of, of how many we can manage. You wanna walk with the mic? I mean, I could walk with the mic too, but no, okay. hold on, hold on. I won't dance with the mic, but it's hard not to. Okay. 
hands. I'm gonna walk toward the back and see if the microphone doesn't do the screechy thing. I'll come back to you. I saw you, I saw you. Yeah. All right. So, so the East San Jose Sun was mentioned, correct? Yes. yes. So here's a picture from the East San Jose Sun that uh, eight years ago I had put on t-shirts for MAPA, right? This is uh, Al Garza, chairman of MAPA, Sophie Mendoza and Ronald Reagan, and in 1968, <laughs> uh, she was housing. Yeah. And that's my dad with his finger and Ronald Reagan's chest. I don't know if that photo, but, but that's one of the leaders here that, that goes unsung. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Vanna, wipe that for a little bit longer. So this is that this is that our lady of Guadalupe that was mentioned. Thank you for that. That's the legacy. No question? Did you? All right. Are there any other questions from any part of the room? Excuse me, I'm gonna squeeze in through here. Hi, my name is Yvonne Martinez Beltran, and I am the sitting councilwoman in the city of Morgan Hill. But I am proudly tied to the East Side. My family grew up in the East Side. My parents, both Art Martinez and Joanne Gutierrez. Um, somebody said we didn't have a lot, but we didn't know we didn't have a lot. And I think that resonates with a lot of people. I, I did not grow up there. They left Salsi Puedes um, and went to Morgan Hill in the sticks. They were told, why are you moving to the sticks? But they moved there because it reminded them of what San Jose had been when they grew up with the orchards and they wanted, you know, the American dream. And so to them, they couldn't afford to buy a home and said, well, my father was a contractor at that time and said, well, we could probably buy some land and I could build a home. She said, do you think we could do that? Yeah, so they did that. Um, but we always came back and, and my grandmother lived here, my Theos, my father's one of nine, my mother's one of six, and our whole family was in the East Side, um, graduated from Overfelt. And I just, you know, um, and I, you know, the stories, what you're doing now is so rich. I've brought my children, which are looking at their father's phone, unfortunately, <laughs> but trying to get them to understand the importance. And that comment that you said, you know, that we didn't have a lot, but we didn't know we didn't have a lot, or maybe didn't know what we didn't have. And I guess my question for you is, you know, I, I realized what we didn't have. Um, and I, I hear the stories about when they realized what they didn't have. And when was it for you that you understand I deal with policy every day and seeing what's happened in the east side and now I mean you've got this Latino coalition on San Jose City Council which is amazing um, you've got more representation for un, you know uh, minority populations and underrepresented when did you realize that what maybe you didn't have when did that awakening come for you when you thought there's an imbalance here. There's an imbalance of resources. There's an imbalance of power. And how do we make things more equitable? That's my question. I'll start and then I'll let uh, others. Um, I told that story of military vehicles coming through our community um, almost on a daily basis during the Vietnam War. And I was little, probably, you know, second, third grade. Um, and there was something that just felt wrong about that. And I would get really scared and my heart would beat really fast every time I saw that. I think that uh, was the first uh, inclination that there was something different that these vehicles kept coming through our brown community. and and telling our stories and 
and having uh, friends whose older brothers were lost in Vietnam and how that, that pain in one community felt so different than any place else. And, and then obviously, um, you know, the redlining in the communities uh, like, like Mayfair and, and then also having our church start their own credit union to support folks uh, to, to buy a home. Um, and so I think though that sparked um, as, as, a, as an older adult now and being able to be reflective about uh, and reading a lot of history and having pioneers like Blanca and others that, that were trailblazers for someone like me that, that I could see, have a role model to look up to and say it's possible because someone have, has paid that, that road, right? And it's really important um, in terms of our own work um, to, to continue to look at policy in a different way for East San Jose. And as I said, I worry about what I'm seeing in terms of gentrification. Um, and so it's really important that we start putting policies in place. Uh, we're looking through our through our Colectiva, the CISA Puerre Collective with five organizations in East San Jose to really start looking at how we can uh, look at policy like COPA and also creating a community development corporation so we can actually buy our own property for our own people um, are really important. So there's a lot of things going on, but I think the first memory was just that. Um, and then my mom taking us every, every Saturday to, um, to stand outside Safeway, the boycotts and getting paper throwing at us and spit at and, and being a young kid and not really understanding, but understanding that there was something much bigger that we were fighting for, so. Thank you for that, Marisa. Oh, thank you. The mic on. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Honorable. Okay, one of the things too is I'm glad that uh, you got to go down to Morgan Hill and, and become an elected official which makes it happen too. So that's one of the things. Um, so one of the other things too, is that um, I've been very fortunate. Okay, let's see, that, that's, there you go. I've been very fortunate that I went to, uh, my parents came up here, my 55, I went to Antioch Baptist Church. And Antioch Baptist Church had a number of people that lived in the East Side, why? Because that was the only place that they can buy a house, okay? And so um, all those leaders that went through Antioch Baptist Church, Inez Jackson, Iola Williams, Reverend Washington, that's right, Reverend Washington was up here. All the folks that were pioneers here that uh, instilled in us that we can go ahead and make it and we can go ahead and do it. And, um, and so when we talked with our friends, you know, it wasn't just about, you know, hey, we're here, lucky to be here. We talked about different things that we went out there and had to go out there and do. Uh, uh, and, and I remember at James Lick, I was part of our BSU and going, yeah. what the heck? <laughs> what the heck? We got to go out there and make these things happen. We're going to step up and make some things happen. And, uh, you know, the light bulb turned on. And so those are some of the things that I appreciate and some of the things that happened here in this community in making it happen. Uh, you mentioned Reverend Washington. Uh, Reverend Washington baptized me and my dad. We were the first father-son baptism that he did before he passed yeah. away. So that was one thing. But Reverend Washington uh, was here in 45, was the first African-American elected official on a school board because it, <laughs> it didn't happen. Okay, and so he instilled in us and the Inez Jacksons instilled in us to figure out how we're going to go out there and work and make these things happen. And so, um, so that's one thing. And the other is, is that you know, my dad also worked with Lynn's dad. Those two were pioneers, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. What they did is that they worked in the system, the ranch, the boys' ranch, juvenile hall, mm -hmm. okay? And said, we're gonna do things differently. We're gonna make sure that we're gonna make sure that people are able to uh, uh, not just put our kids here, 
we're going to make sure that we are human and we respect and we make sure that we make leaders out of these kids that come here to the ranch, not just punish them. And so I remember my dad and, and, and Mr. Ramirez always talking about that, trying to figure out how they can go out there and make uh, and lead that way. So those are some of the things that, again, um, some of the folks that we had that made our DNA better, okay? Because again, you know, it, it gave us that pride. It gave us the things that we had to go out there and to do. That's why we were up here and we're leading. And, you know, one of the nice things, I know all these folks here, okay? I know their families, okay? And, you know, <clears throat> we might not see each other that often, but the thing but is still that we connect on how we have to make some things work, okay? Whether it's just a conversation we might have, okay, we're going to make it work. We're going to make things better. So that's one of the great things about being up here and also being part of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think uh, what struck me about, you know, when did we know that, you know, we were not, you know, rich or whatever. I looked at it kind of in a different way is that I didn't know that we had such a reputation in, you know, the other parts of the city um, and, and being looked down upon until I became, you know, an adult. And then later as a news reporter, I was given the freedom and the editorial control to find stories. And, and I always tried to make it a point whenever there was a story that could be told anywhere, such as, you know, uh, a graduation or something like that. I always wanted to find, I go on the East side to find it because, um, there are so many positive stories out here. If you, if you just look for them, and they don't always pop up to your consciousness. And a lot of uh, people from other parts of the Bay Area maybe wouldn't think to look over here for a positive story. So, you know, when, when Overfelt um, would have their graduation, they, they started a, a thing where they would get all of the graduating seniors and they would all get t-shirts for where they were gonna go to college. Um, that was a great story. And I did that, you know, for several years. Uh, and that kind of story happens everywhere. But I always would always make it a point to try and cover that on the east side, because I knew that, you know, we need to tell positive stories about what's happening here, because Lord knows that there's a lot of reporting that goes on that is not so favorable about our area, uh, focusing on crime and things like that. Um, especially with COVID recently. I mean, it's just, you know, it's been it's been a downer. Uh, but that's, you know, I realized that, you know, I was in that position and given, you know, Channel 5 has always given me the encouragement to tell those stories positively. They want that, they even more so now. And so it was always, you know, a, a great thing to be able to tell positive stories that are happening. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've interviewed, you know, Joelle and, and uh, Maritza for stories. You know, recently I was got to do the story about the Cesar Chavez house, and that was awesome. You know, being able to tell that story and go, we now have, you know, worldwide audiences because of the internet. Everything goes that we do, you know, used to be kind of one and done. We go on the air here, and then that was, you know, archived and never looked at again. But because of, you know, YouTube, in the internet, we all of our stories get are there, um, you know, for the future. So, you know, being able to find and tell wonderful human, beautiful stories on the east side uh, to kind of counterbalance everything else that's being said about the area has been one of the things that I've always tried to do. So uh, I like this question, and um, because I'm a retired educator, I, I think about the inequalities in the educational system. Uh, when I became a teacher, only 13% uh, of uh, teachers were Latino, Latina, with the kids running about almost 50% in the state of California. Uh, when I became a superintendent, it went down to 11% of uh, superintendents, Latino, Latina. Um, there's a lot of inequalities, and you know that they, they continue to exist. I've worked in Cupertino Union Elementary School District. I've worked in the East Side District. And we have a funny way of funding our schools in the state based on the property values. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the property values, you get the taxes that pays for the schools. 
So uh, that's why we're always asking for money on this side of town because the property values are lower. I mean, I think everybody knows that. If you're gonna go buy a house in Cupertino, you're gonna pay five times as much. So they get five times as much to run their schools. But it also happens within a school district. I opened up Evergreen Valley High School as the first principal. I didn't know how special that was. <laughs> But I, I happened to be the one that they tagged. And I, and then my next assignment then was James Lick. That's when you started to cover me because they had the lowest API in the county when they came. And they had broken windows. They had bathrooms that didn't work in the same school district. So we always, going back to what makes us special is we see what's wrong. Find something that means something to you and get involved. Find something. Leadership is taking responsibility for something that matters to you. The Lord put you here, the Great Spirit put you here for a reason. Find your purpose and go after it and fix it. That way, when you meet the lady upstairs, she'll be okay with what you do with your life. Thank you. Thank you, Oh, one last thing. One minute. Uh, I just want to commend Len because I think I think the other piece that's really important, stories that have not been told, is is how newspapers and and cameras come into our neighborhood. Um, and many books have been written about East San Jose. Many books. Um, the importance of getting a perspective from an East San Joseer that understands deeply our culture and who we are in East San Jose is so important for storytelling and giving that perspective that many people who come in um, and are looking for those stories and looking to divide us um, are really important. So again, uh, just the importance of of how our stories are told and by whom they're told right. uh, is important. So just thank you, Lynn, for always looking out. And Enrico Chacon also, right. who started uh, with this work in East San Jose are just really, really important. Right. Thank you again to our panelists for the part one segment. We do have a part two, and we're gonna do a quick transition along with a quick break. Some of you have been sitting for a long time. and. Uh, we're gonna to try to keep our transitional time short so that we can roll over into the next panelists and pick it up from there. Thanks again. If we could have another round of applause for our first segment. For the youngsters in the room, come and say hi to Doña Blanca Alvarado. She's the founder of the Mexican Heritage Plaza. It's there because of her. Okay, um, thank you very much. We are having our transition. I want to just remind you that we do have the survey. You can get the QR code, use your phone, so you can fill it on your phone and submit it through there, or you can do the paper and just leave it in the basket. That would be enough. We have some pens there. I also want to encourage you, if you are leaving in this question of stories, to please remember that the library is here to collect your stories. That's what yeah, the right. East Side yeah. Dreams exhibit is about and sharing your story. So don't be scared of the librarians. We're here to collect right. your story and to make sure that the story is told uh, correctly. So thank you very much. Yeah, I will.
I just turned it off. Hello? 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 Attention, attention. Everybody sit back down, please. We got to get to part two. All right. Come on, part two. <laughs> We're ready. We're ready. Okay. I have her contact information. Remind me. <laughs> part two. Part two. Everybody sit down, please. It might be Charlie. Oh my God. Far away. Oh, no. Yeah, that old, yeah. Let's see who's sitting over there. All right, folks, I know we're having a great east side time, but if we could transition into the second part of the panel experience, I just want to be surely. If we could please join our heels. Because what we know about Chicanas from the east side is we're bossy. So I'm going to get us all in our seats. Sound good? And I'm going to walk around Oprah style and get us all in our seats. All comfy back in our seats. We will have time after okay. panel two, I promise. Or maybe Shirley. Okay, I think so, maybe. Okay, so. All right. Let's not push me to the brink of singing because I will. Okay, no holds bar, he said here. We're going to let it all. Even our language. My favorite word is the language. Over here, wrangling people. All right, folks, we have part two. All brand new panelists, decades deep activism. This is the activism segment, as you can tell, hear, see, feel from panel one. We overlap. So some of our east side lived experience folks are also activists. It's inherent in how we do and what we do. And our bossiness indeed is leadership. I'm gonna switch my view for the day and be on this side. Our panelists are gonna be here to my left from your perspective. We're not gonna do all the pleasantries from part one because we're gonna jump right in to the questions and the conversation. But I am going to roll out the introductions and because I don't have them all memorized. Quick. And we start off with Maria Perez, former Eastside activist, worked in gang, drug, and alcohol prevention for 40 years and counting. I hope so. I think we've got one going over here. Then we've got Doreen Garcia Navelle worked in nursing for 30 years, helping Spanish speakers overcome language related service barriers. The daughter of San Jose activist Ernestina and Tony Garcia. Doreen was involved in activist. Unida. We have Tony Estremera, a lawyer focused on immigrant rights and diversity and served with the Legal Aid Society of Santa Clara County the Mexican-American Political Association, and the Mayor's Committee on Minority Affairs, among many other efforts. And last but not least, Shirley Trevino, a former San Jose youth activist who has worked in labor relations for over 40 years, co-founder of several organizations, including Causa, Latina Coalition, Lula Gilroy, the Institute for Nonviolence, and Wajina de Paz, and has been named one of the 100 most influential Latinos in Silicon Valley. I do believe you're on my express email list anytime we have some movidas in action. And so it's a pleasure to be here with all of these wonderful activists today. Questions we've got in the queue, and we'll see where the conversation goes because it's never enough time. What events occurred that drove you to become active in the name of community. What events occurred that drove you to become active 
in the name of your community. Anybody like to kick it off first? people got involved and how you became active and how we accepted the challenges of uh, how we accepted the challenges of of the changing times and uh you know it, it, the, the the panel said you know we love east side and it, you know it was a great place to be but there was always that other side of the east side that wasn't necessarily the nice part of the east side and i am an east sider but i'm an east sider from east bakersfield and um I was in kindergarten when I realized that there was a big difference between me and, and the, little, the little white girl next to me. My underwear were made of Arina sacks. They were flower sacks, but they had flowers on them. And, and when I love to do the, uh, the, the, you know, the little bar go across. And at one point when they started laughing at my underwear, I knew that you know, I, I needed to change this story, you know, um, but also you had a loss of Cesar Chavez. He went to Delano, which was not very far from Bakersfield in 1962. My sister got pregnant when she was very young. She married a farm worker and moved to Delano. And uh, she came home one day and says, you have to meet this man. You have to meet this man. He's this incredible, incredible a person, very humble, but, you know, has a lot to say. So my mom, we didn't have a car, but her, her husband had a car. So one day he picked us up and he took us over and we met the, this beautiful, beautiful person. And so I was surrounded in Bakersfield by Greatfields and Jamara was one of the biggest ranchers there who, you know, Cesar tried to organize, organize and never could. But also what inspired me was when I was told in high school that I was not college material. And uh, this man is responsible for helping me to change that. And so those little tidbits of how I became an activist and uh, what led me to do what I do. Anyone else on the panel like to answer that question? Oh, okay. I have a real heavy story to share with you about my mother. Uh, I come from a family of farm workers. I was born, I'm the first born of Ernestina and Antonio Garcia. My abuelito Papa Chico was a Yaqui soldier in the Mexican Revolution. At the age of 15, I began to hear his stories about the revolution. My mother went to a segregated school in Arizona with her whole family. My mother is, was a sixth born of 18. She, uh, uh, the family finally came to California in 1937. I grew up hearing stories from my mother about how it was when she went to elementary school, how if you spoke Spanish, they would stick you in the closet for the day. So she had a, a lot of, she didn't like to go to school. She said she'd rather stay home because of the way they were mistreated. In the 1950s and the 1960s, we lived in Oakland. My mother uh, saw a lot of discrimination because my mother was dark skinned, as were my brothers and my sisters. I was a Lerita. Uh, and that's, I, I didn't like the way that they used to treat my brother and my mother and my sister because they were dark. And so it always stuck, stuck with me growing up. I want to give credit to my parents who supported me and stood by me through thick and thin. I am my mother's revolution. Mom could not have done the things that she did without the support of my father. My father was uh, her, her uh, consultant. He was her confidant. He was everything to my mom. He was her bodyguard. He, uh, he took care of my mom. When we moved to Melpitas, because my mother started getting involved with what was happening, uh, we moved to Melpitas, and the first thing we did was my mom took us kids, uh, I remember my brother and my sister, some of us in strollers out there picketing at the PW market on the east side. It was there that we met Raquel Silva and her family. We were there handing out leaflets, uh, boycotting for grapes and for the lettuce. And then one time my mom took me to the Leno to visit uh, the farm workers over there. We went and uh, into uh, one lady's home and I was shocked 
because there was a baby there that had no eyes, he had no limbs, and it was because he was uh, the mother who had been uh, in contact with pesticides. And it really broke my heart. I was uh, probably about 17, 16 years old, and I remember I said, Mom, I got, we got to do something about this. Uh, when I was in uh, high school, and this is back in 1968, there were several incidents that happened. Like there was a, what I call the Aranda incident. The Aranda incident was in homeroom. Uh, there were some brothers there, the Aranda brothers, that spoke no English. And so the teacher there, instead of giving them givers there to get credit for high school, instead she would tell, tell me to translate to these young brothers that they had to go out in the yard and pick up papers. They were gonna supposed to clean the yard and when they come back and they say, oh, she tell me, send them back out. The class isn't over yet. So there they go. But we found out later that that was in violation of Title VI, which meant that they were supposed to be providing, the school district was supposed to be providing uh, bilingual services for these students and they weren't. Another thing that happened, and this was kind of, Kind of funny, I, I, they put me in a photography class. I didn't want to be in the photography class. I, I told my mom, I don't like this class. I, I want to get out of it, but the counselor won't take me out. And so mom, could you please come with me? Cause she's not listening to me. Please come with me to go talk to this counselor. So mom came in, we went in there and the lady uh, motioned us to come in her office. We sat down and then the lady started trying to say, now, Doreen, tell your mother that this class will be, this photography class will be very good for you because I have a friend named Paquita and that's what she does. She goes to the bars and she takes pictures and you could have a good job doing that and that would be good for you and your family. And she could say, now tell your mother. And I turned and I looked at my mom and my mom stood up because the lady thought my mom didn't speak any English. You know, and my mom spoke the perfect English. And so she stood up and she said, what did you say? And the lady, she was just a white lady. She turned a bright red, you know, and mom started on her. And you people, what do you think we are that we would have our daughter go and do those kind of things? You know, that's when we found out, we, we looked into, found out that they had this tracking system where they would put those of us who are brown or black in the low classes. There's no such thing as vocational classes. And that's, they were just wanting to push us through or have us drop out. So anyway, we found out all about that. And, and it was like, I'll, I'll never forget that lady's face when, when mom stood up and started telling her where to go about, hey, who do you think we are? Where do you think we are? You know, and so the lady, all of a sudden, there was so much rumpus in the room that the vice principal came over and said, what's going on here? And, uh, and mom stood up and she said, yeah, she says, we'll be back. We're going to handle you. She told him, she said, this and this, she, she, she really went off on here. I thought she was going to smack the counselor because she was so mad. And I stood up, you know, in those days, I, I didn't cuss. And I stood up and I said, this is a bunch of shit. And, and so then my mother, I thought, oh no, mom's really gonna get me now. She uh, talking like that in public, you know? But when we left, it was cool. But mom understood that I was angry and we were both angry. And so we, sh we shared that together. Um, another thing that happened there in, in school was that a, at a junior high, they had a, a student, you know, they take yearbook pictures and where there was a student that wasn't there they put a picture, a caption of a sleeping Mexican. And they said, asleep again, under and he said, well, we pointed that out to mom and whoa, that was it. The, they came together and we formed, uh, we said, that's time that we have to get a Chicano student union on this campus. So that's what we went about doing. We also had the parents behind us who came out and they formed themselves as the pro estudiantil for us students, they were there to help back us up. We at one time, you know, cause uh, this was in 69, at one time we were uh, the, the comité, we chartered a, a bus, we took the students, we went to go see Assessor Chavez, we took a donation of $100, he thanked us, he wrote us a letter, we were all very proud about that. 
there were, uh, at that time, I guess you could say, uh, the Malpita School Board, we had a big old blowout with the school board. There were educators, Chicano educators, Chicano teachers, Chicano professors, uh, superintendents that came to support us and to really let the Malpita Board know that we were dissatisfied with what was going on there, that this was not acceptable. So anyway, so that's what happened there. There were walkouts. When the Chicano Student got, Union got together, we had three walkouts. We walked out against the tracking system. We walked out because of the high rate of expulsions. We walked out because of the rate of the uh, dropouts that were going on and because of the way that they were had us like pendejos over there. So we walked out. And uh, another thing, I guess my parents, I was really lucky because my mom and dad were pretty progressive. And my mom, you know, she allowed for me to join the Teatro Urbano. I joined the Teatro Urbano under the directorship of Daniel Valdez. We would travel up and down the state of California. At one time, we even flew to Denver, Colorado, and stayed with Corky Gonzalez and his wife, Jerry. The Guerrilla Theater would put skits about farm workers about, and the growers, about the police and the migra. The Teatro also featured musica by El Robledo, Ben Cadena, Yolanda Perez, and his sister, and Felipe and his sister, Deborah Rodriguez. Uh, as the momentum began to pick up, I call it the evolution of revolution, we had, we come across what we call the Fiesta de las Rosas. In 1969, this happened. The Fiesta de las Rosas was a thing put on by the city of San Jose honoring the Spanish conquest. And uh, Chicanos were not pleased because we were taxpayers. And here they were using our taxpayers' money. We had no sidewalks on the east side. They were using taxpayers' monies to, uh, to, uh, to have this parade. And this, at the end of the parade, they would have, the only thing I ever saw that was a, about a Mexican was they had a guy with a burro at the end of the parade. And then the burro sat down and he wouldn't move and they were trying to get the burro to move until we saw it like a, a burla, you know? There was a, a blowout that we, at the end of the parade, Chicanos came together, we went and they picketed. Uh, at the end of the parade, the police came after us. The police busted a lot of people. Um, and that, after that happened, that was, uh, we all met at what is now the Civic Center, I believe. And uh, it was an empty lot at that time. And we all met there. And that was the beginning of the formation of the Congregación de la Raza Unida. I'm going to ask for a quick pause right there. Okay. So we have, we have, uh, I know you have others. You're touching on my other questions. I'm like, okay. that's a perfect segue right there. Okay. So you're leaving us and I'll remember. Okay, I'll 69, come back to you. 70? 69. Right? Thank you. So I'm hearing a lot of injustice. And if uh, I'm hearing correctly from Doreen's account, it goes all the way back decades deep. And every reiteration that we've heard, similar theme, similar dynamic, right? This representation of community in a very narrow way and folks, you feel it, we've all felt it, right? We've all felt it, we've all seen it, different times in our lives. And so Doreen and I appreciate the connection to the history and bringing in you know, the generations of your parents and how important that was in activating your journey. And I'm not gonna forget where your story left off because I wanna hear the whole thing. Oh, okay. The whole thing, but so I'm gonna take a pause right now yeah, okay, because sure. we have, I saw yeah. Maria picked up the microphone. Yeah. You wanna click on that? Yes, yes. Oh, oh, thank you. and Shirley too. And I think Shirley, we're going to yeah. see a lot of overlap, right? Because I know you all know yes. each other, but I think a lot of different points of overlap in their story and in the injustice and the activism. Yeah, um, I think this is Yeah, let's get the, and it'll turn green. Okay. First of all, I want to thank. Um, Stella and Shane and Rosanna and the team here of um, San Jose Library for this honor. And I take it very humbly to be here before you and to share my story. Um, I uh, wasn't born and raised on the east side, but I was 
um, very active in the east side. Um, I want to say that the the question was how did it how did my experience um, affect or impact me into like becoming a community activist? Correct. Uh, so my experience, I believe, started like in elementary school and. I vaguely remember being, that's why I was going to piggyback on the experiences in the school that I was, I felt the same um, oppression of um, the little Mexicanita that was not treated the same as the Caucasian um, student. And uh, my dad used to always tell us, you know, um, respeta, you know, respect your teachers, don't talk back, you know, you do what they say. And so that I was raised with a lot of that um, respeto and um, valores and humildad and all of that. My father was a very upright man and he, you know, he did his best at raising us. So I went into school, you know, with that mindset that I was, you know, going to respect, you know, my hierarchy, my teachers, my leaders. Uh, but when I started to experience as I started, you know, developing and moving through the educational system that I wasn't being treated the same. It, it, you know, it did something to me. It irked me. It caused uh, a fire within me to say something, to do something. I just didn't know what, but I would stand up. I would say, you know, why can't we, you know, why are you picking on us? Why do you treat us differently? Why don't we have Chicano teachers? I started to question, you know, the, the sistema, the systems that I felt oppressed by. And at the time, I didn't even know it was oppression. I just knew that this is not fair, you know? I'm not feeling equal to other people and other students. So I started getting involved in the Mayo Club, the Mexican American um, Youth Organization. Back then, it was a it's a, a club of the of the Mexican American students, and we would organize in high school, organize clubs and organize dances and car shows and things like that. But there was a lot of barriers. We had to face a lot of barriers and obstacles just to put a parade together, to put a assembly together. And that's when I really became active. And I said, you know, we need to do something about this and we need to fight this because we have just the same right as anybody else and any other student. And because I'm brown, and because I'm frowned upon and looked down upon, it doesn't matter. I said, because we have a rich cultura, we have a rich culture that we need to share and we need to celebrate. And so that's when I started becoming active and it was in my, it was in my high school years. And then uh, I'll tell some more stories later. <laughs> and I'll, I'll join you, <laughs> I'll join you, uh, I'll join you with my mask off. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting that um, a couple of the folks up here, uh, three of the people up here that I recall, their parents, you know, like uh, uh, Anthony Alexander, his dad, Chuck, uh, uh, Danny Garza, his, his dad, uh, you know, Al, and uh, of course, uh, Len Ramirez, his dad, uh, Len Sr., uh, were all very active in the old days. And so uh, I think it's instructive that uh, their children are also activists. And I'm sure that their children's children are also activists. That's what the East Side is really all about. I tell you, I became I became very active, became an activist because of the people that I met on the East Side. Mm -hmm. I'm an East Coast uh, transplant, and I when I first uh, lived in East San Jose, um, I lived right there on Lawson Avenue, around the corner from Cesar Chavez family's house, and uh, I I was lucky when I was 16. Uh, I had a mailman who was the the, the deacon, the head deacon there at Guadalupe Church, uh, Phil Marquez. His picture's outside there, uh, uh, right outside here. And Phil, um, you know, used to um, uh, talk to everybody in the community and organize people in the community as a mailman. As I recall, he would talk, walk around, knew everybody in the neighborhood. Uh, and so uh, he invited me over to the Grail where they used to have, um, in those days, uh, a lot of the activists, not just on the east side, but in all of San Jose, people from the west side that were very progressive, uh, uh, non-colored people, uh, lawyers and so on, together with people on the east side who were activists. And there, you know, for the first time in my life, I met all these great folks that I still know today. And like I mentioned, their children, you know, uh, Ramiro Perez, 
who uh, was an activist for many years, who in fact was a master guitarist and taught Danny Valdez and Luis and those guys yeah, yeah. how to play guitar, how to sing and, and wrote songs for them. Uh, people like that, Sophie Mendoza, who we all know now, but you know, Sophie who was doing this for 50 years. She started over there at the Roosevelt High School and had a walk out and, and fix and fought to improve the educational system here. And I met Sophie there. Fred Hirsch, who many of you know as an activist for again, 60, 70 years, I met him there. So I met all these great folks there at the Grail and uh, little by little, I started getting involved and I went to the second meeting of, of a community organization that had just formed called United People Arriba. Uh, and it was in those days, you know, we had a lot of people on these side that were involved in community organizing and they had these young, young, young folks from all over the country, the name uh, that, that, that were part of the VISTA program. Forgot what, you know, the VISTA meant, but they were volunteers and that's what they did. They went around the country and they uh, organized communities. And so uh, we used to go door to door and, and try to get the community involved. And one of the first things that we did was to uh, demand that, that the city put a, a, a street light on the corner of, of San Antonio and King. Because in the old days, 101, you know, uh, used to have lights. It wasn't overpasses. You know, you would stop at each light once you got to San Jose. It turned into lights. And so uh, we had a light there, and then people would fly down and kill two or three people on that corner. And I remember there the five, the five J store, you know, that Ernie Batia had, because of mm -hmm. course he had five sons and they were all named, you know, the names all started with J, you know, say Juan, Jaime, and so on. And right there on that corner, many folks got run over and so on. And so we 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 organized the community to get us a light on that corner. And then the next thing that, that we did was um, Joseph, you know, that the San Antonio school was gonna be named Joseph George. And at the time, Joseph George was the largest liquor distributor west of the Mississippi. And we thought that's outrageous that in our community, they would name a school after this guy. And so we organized the community, went to the school board and said, you know, we can't allow this kind of name here. And we suggested different names, Benito Juarez, you know, uh, the first indigenous president of Mexico and uh, the first African-American uh, person that died in the Revolutionary War, Christmas Addicts. And there were a number of other names and some one of them, San Antonio School and so on. But we got the school to send out uh, notice to all the parents and have them vote for a name. That's how San, and San Antonio, because it's on San Antonio Street, you know, that's why it's called San Antonio and not Joseph George. And so there were these different, um, you know, these different issues that we got together. We'll talk about the issues later. But uh, United People Arriba, because too many of us were getting killed by police, no different than today. Uh, too many uh, African Americans and Latinos were being killed on the east side and then downtown. Uh, and so that community organization, United People Arriba, assigned a couple of us to go start Community Alert Patrol. And, uh, you know, I've been active ever since then. And some of the same issues, unfortunately, keep coming up. But um, I'll, I'll move it along to the next question. Thank you. So some of you all have already started to. To move into the, the second question they've got going on, um, and that's what was your evolution as an activist and what were some of the defining moments and issues you faced? And again, I'm going to respectfully have to interrupt some of our seasoned activists here uh, in the spirit of time. And that's the unfortunate part about panel discussions is that they offer a richness and a vibrancy of voice and story, but there's never enough time. So it's my job to be the conscientious interrupter con todo respeto. But this is a perfect segue back into Noreen, the, the Doreen's story, excuse me, um, because you left off on the, the, the trajectory and, and your journey and what was happening in the late 60s, early 70s, and um, your continuing evolution as an activist, right? Starting from the injustice you experienced in school, like some of the books here, and moving into all of these other aggressions. That, that you're responding to and also being proactive about, right? So if you wanna pick it back up there. Okay, well, I, I left off where the Confederacion formed themselves in 1969. Uh, 
San Jose at that time was evolving from a rural community to an urban community. Uh, the Confederacion grew to become 70 raza, indigenous native community uh, from organizations. And they had eight lawsuits. There were lawsuits against the city of San Jose, the state of California, the city of Los Altos, the police department of San Jose, the US Department of Health and Education, all on behalf of the Chicanara. There were many changes that were made and we demanded bilingual voting materials, bilingual voting directories, bilingual phone operators, and the hiring of more bilingual teachers, teachers in our schools. We saw hospitals, we made hospitals stop dumping poor patients on the streets because they could not pay for their services. We had to point out things as, as such as the Hill Burton Act and the right for human beings to have health care regardless of their ability to pay. There were zoning policies that were examined. We saw the hiring of more Chicanos in city contracts. Uh, we pushed affirmative action power. In those days, I started San Jose State. I joined Meta. At that time, so the Confederacion used to have annual meetings where they would have all these organizations come and uh, they would have delegates from each organization. They would come and they would uh, talk about what they were going to do, what their plans were, what their goals were, where they were heading. And so that's, uh, I used to be a delegate for Mecha uh, to the meetings. And at one point I became an also delegate of the Mujeres de Aslan. At that time, remember, we went on the east side of Story and King and we picketed against the Frito Lake because they had the Frito Bandito. And uh, we went out there and picketed because they were, it was, to us, it was uh, derogatory and, and def, you know, it was defamation. So we went and we did that. Other things that really uh, affected me was the Chicano moratorium, the death of Ruben Salazar, and the killings of our brothers and our sisters in the Vietnam War. So that's, uh, we were really head, head to that. In 1970, I joined the Community Alert Patrol, CAP. We joined because uh, Chicano families were being brutalized on the east side of San Jose. So we formed our own police patrol. We used cameras, tape recorders, shortwave radios, and we would witness what the police were up to. Sometimes we didn't show, the, show up there before they even came. They hated us, they hated us. Uh, what happened was at one time at Hellyer Park, there was a big, uh, uh, like a riot, I guess you could say, and Cap uh, was there. And uh, I was there as well. I wasn't uh, working with Cap that day, but I was there with the other students. We were all young. Uh, I have to mention that the, the pigs chased us from Bacresto Park to William Street Park. They chased us to every single park. And we were like, sometimes it would be families. Families, they looked at us like gang members. And we were not gang members, we were families. So they chased us from that. After a while, it was like, oh, the pigs are surrounding this park. Let's get out of here. So we left. But we went from William Street Park, the Kessel Park, finally to Hellier Park. And at Hellier Park, uh, I don't know, somebody came out with a gun and started shooting. The cops were up above. They came down. They swooped on us. They got the cops' uh, tape recorders and on cameras and put it in front of uh, this guy's car. And they told the guy to leave or he was going to be arrested. So I saw this and I went up there and I said, wait a minute. You can't do that. That's like private property. What do you think you're doing? You can't be doing that. And next thing I know, I had four cops. I had two cops on top of me. Well, you know, I was a black beret. I had learned uh, also some martial arts. So I turned around and I kicked a cop right in the face. Saw him go down. Next thing I know, I had four cops on top of me and they carried me to the paddy wagon. They threw me in the paddy wagon and who was in there? Shirley was in there. <laughs> Rachel Silva was in there. You know, and I was, I was 18 years old. I was scared. I was like, uh oh, I'm really going to get it from mom this time. You know, uh oh, but it didn't go that way. I had to tell mom, but mom, I got busted with your comadre. 
you know, mom, I'm innocent. You know, it's like I had to explain to her what was going on. And she heard, got it from Shirley and from Rachel where exactly where that happened. So I didn't get in any trouble. <laughs> so anyway, I was brought into the Black Berets by Jesse Dominguez. We learned about martial arts. We learned about handguns and guns and we became aware of our Chicanismo. We traveled to Oakland and we would meet with the autonomous Brown Berets and the Black Panther Party to form alliances and coalitions around police brutality issues. We had a breakfast program on the east side to feed the children and the older Black Berets taught martial arts as a way for our people to protect ourselves from the police. We did many of security for the UFW, for Cesar Chavez, for many community marches in San Jose and for Corky Gonzalez when he would come uh, to San Jose. And we did this as a way to secure the safety of our communities from the police. We were a proud bunch. I keep going. I think I'm gonna pause you right there because I'm having a moment of reflection. <laughs> okay, because I still got a little I, more. You got so much and I love it. And I think it's important, right? Because part of, uh, I know the librarian, a lot of what they've shared in conversations, overlapping meetings and current activism is the importance of keeping these stories alive, the importance of reminding people we've been not just struggling, but resisting in resilient ways and ways that impact the country's landscape. And I think sometimes we miss the part of San Jose's importance in that history. So I thank you, Doreen, for keeping that alive and for mm. telling it so thoroughly. Yeah, and I but, think uh, we, we need, I'm like, can I get a copy of this? I want to assign it for class. I'm not kidding. Okay. So sure. I, I think my evolution, like I mentioned earlier, kindergarten, meeting Cesar in high school, and then moving from East Bakersfield to East Side San Jose. We lived in the Tropicana area. And one day I was walking down King Road and at the little 7-Eleven store on the corner of King Road and Story, they were picketing. And um, I stopped to find out what was going on. And what happened was they were targeting little Latino kids. They were walking in the store. They were following them in. Mm. They were saying that they were, you know, uh, stealing from the store. So I joined the picket line. And uh, my, I was staying with my aunt and my aunt went by and I go, she said, oh my God, when I got there, she goes, what were you doing out there on that picket line? And I said, I, and I explained to her what was going on. And so um, a big mentor of mine, of course, uh, before all the women of the East Side became my mentors was Father Anthony Soto. And um, we had started the uh, Young Christian Movement, uh, which was a, basically a radical Euro European uh, Catholic student union, uh, student movement. And basically what it was is to observe a situation, judge a situation and act on that situation. And so based upon that tenet, based upon that whole idea became my life goal. You observe something that's going wrong, you judge what you gotta do, and then you take action on what you've gotta do. And so um, I went to, uh, I was going to school, at City College, I was working and I was taking care of my mom and um, my father had died when I was two. And um, I, was, I went to Father Soto and I said, Father, I said, I wanna do one thing. I said, I wanna do work with people and change uh, the way things are going on. And he says, it'll come to you. It, you'll know when it comes to you. So I was sitting at the quad at uh, City College and there was a little pamphlet next to me and it was the program that he talked about, Volunteers in Service to America. And um, I, I wanted to go to uh, work in uh, New York and change Spanish Harlem. <laughs> and uh, they, I couldn't tell my mom because she would have had a fit. Little Latina women, young girls do not leave their home, you know. And the older ones, I was the older one at the time, stay to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. So they sent me a plane ticket and I went off to New York. And um, I think one of the big things that I did there was that there was a rent strike and they gave us a dollar. And they said, you're going into that community. This is your lunch money. I was the only one that came back with my dollar because I got involved in the rent strike and started, um, had a free lunch with all the people in that community. And so I did that for like a year and a half. 
And then this man who fought for more scholarships at Santa Clara University and for more Chicanos to go there. I got a call from Manuel Gonzalez and, and said, surely you've got to come back to, and go to Santa Clara University and you'll, you've got a scholarship. And this is the man along with just a few five that were there fought for us to have that. And so then I fought for them. We got arrested at the university uh, for uh, asking for, they had done a, a report on Chicanos and they wouldn't give it to us. And so we, got, we, we took over the university and we got arrested there. And, Ernestina and, and you know, Rachel Silva and all the community at the East Side were over there uh, supporting us. So then um, part of this, I, in touch with this man, but I also became I, I, I involved because there were women who impacted my life at that time. Ernestina Garcia was one of them, Rachel Silva. I was one of the ones that got arrested at Hellyer Park. I was taking pictures with a camera that showed the police brutality that was taking place. And when they started coming after us, we were all in two different cars. And I wanna say that the important part of going to Hellier Park was that kids had come to a PAT meeting at Guadalupe Church and said, we're be our cars, our low rider cars are being hit with batons, we're being beat up, we want you to come and patrol. And so we, there were some of us that volunteered, I volunteered and, and, and went out there. And um, as we're taking pictures, uh, they're running, the cops are running after us. To, they want the cameras because we're taking pictures of the police brutality. And all, it was a hot day. We're, we're all together. And all of us, not, they didn't go to their car. They came to one car and we were all there. And Fran Escalante said, debajo del trato de Guadalupe Hidalgo, usted tiene repetir esa orden en español. And they go, oh my God. Who speaks Spanish around here? They all, they only speak Spanish. They were and we, we were kind of buying time, right? Because, but it was so hot in the car that I rolled down the window and, you know, they got my hair. I was 90 pounds at that time. And I just said, you know what? My hair is not going to be a martyr to this movement. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so we opened the doors and they took our cameras. They tore out the film. They took our tape recorders. They ran over them. And um, yeah. we were doing that because we were patrolling the police on the east side to make sure that they were not going to beat up Chicanos, they were not going to kill more Chicanos, as Tony said, they were killing Chicanos and Blacks, uh, you know, one right after the other, and we were on the east side to make sure that uh, this wasn't going to happen. And so that day we got rested, um, Rachel Silva, Fran, we all went, I said, I am not going to get found guilty. I'm going to go into that courtroom and I'm going to look like Trisha Nixon. I'm going to wear red, white, and blue, and I'm going to have a little <laughs> red, white, and blue ribbon on my hair. Fran went in and Rachel went in their, their combat boots and fatigues, and I got acquitted and they got convicted. <laughs> it's not funny, but um, later on, we sued the, the police department yeah. and uh, for the damage that they did to the equipment that, and, and we won. And, you know, that we continued that struggle yeah. uh, in, in, in uh, East Side San Jose. Uh, I later joined the, never in the history of the whole United States of farm workers able to vote for a union until Cesar Chavez negotiated with Governor Brown yeah. to have a law that gave them the right to vote, 1975. I was working at Casa Legal there, waiting to appear from law school. And I got a call from Ron Reese, who said, we're looking for uh, people to go, uh, law students to go. And I said, yeah, uh, I'd like to go. And he goes, oh, I didn't think you'd ever leave East Side San Jose, but you, you, you start tomorrow. So for 15 years, I worked for the Agriculture Labor Relations, making sure that farm workers got fired were gonna be given their jobs back because they supported the union. Mm -hmm. And so then I continued to do that work. and. Um, uh, when the, the LRB ran out of money, uh, Ed Viagan from Lee Matson School mm. hired me, and he's he said, surely he goes, uh, there's a big absentee rate in uh, in the east in the, here at the school at Lee Matson. He goes, and I want you to change that. I says, I think I'm probably the person to do that. So then, when I went to the first uh, uh, door to knock on, you know, they gave us the names of the kids and where they lived, and he hadn't gone to school because he didn't have any shoes. Oh. He was, didn't have no shoes. And so I started a little clothing store there at the school and I would 
uh, size their feet on my arm, run back to the school, get the shoes, get put the shoes on them, and bring them back to Lee Matson. Oh. And it was the first time in the whole history of Lee Matson that the 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 absentee rate had been lowered. But I continued that work, uh, you know, to benefit the East Side. When her mother left uh, Confederacion, she told me that I had I had to become the next president. Now. I didn't necessarily want to become the next president. Uh, it was a lot of work. But at that time, I became the next president. And at that time, we were fighting, like Tony said, for, for and we were fighting also for Latinos to get hired in the, in the police department so that they could be more sensitive to the needs of our community. Mm -hmm. And so they had a Chicano, they were mocking us. They had a Chicano sheriff's test. Uh, with all these, who's the president of the United States? Ricardo Montalban, you know, just, Stupid questions. And so Ernestine and I had a press conference and we we slammed the, the police for having done this. We got sued for slander. And I got served with the paper because I was president of Confederacion. Well, lo and behold, that guy who sued us ended up being my boss at the LRB, <laughs> Dave Sterling. <laughs> but anyway, I continue my involvement today, my activism today. I, I'm now vice president of Lulac San Benito County. I've, I've started several yeah. organizations since then, Garas and Gilroy, with, along with other people, active in education, civil rights, health issues. Um, the woman that was on the panel here, I do consulting and I had thought uh, for workers that were getting, not getting, they were working in a tunnel, not getting breaks or lunches. And she gave me her office so I could interview them several months ago. And so I came back to the East Side. I work with the farm worker caravan, Darlie Tennis. Uh, she had a Taco Tuesday over in the Story Road to raise money for farm workers. And I'm still doing that. And she mm. did it at the best taco place in, in, in San Jose, East Side San Jose. And it was El Portal on Story Road. So go down there and visit. And uh, <laughs> so I continue the struggle today and all my activism. And I'll do it till the day I die. Uh -huh. yeah. I can really relate, I'm just like kind of connecting with a lot. Um, so um, as I graduated out of high school, I'm just gonna kind of pick up where I left off. I graduated, I just barely graduated out of high school. And um, I always felt like we weren't the cream of the crop, you know? And so just getting to high school was really difficult. Um, let me back up a little bit before um, graduation, because um, this is a really important piece. Um, in one of the, um, the summer before I graduated, uh, I got a job, a summer job with, um, with uh, Maxa. And now I'm already kind of like, you know, fired up about the injustices and the racism and all of that that's going on with the students. So I get a job. I didn't know anything about, about Maxa. Maxa was a Mexican American community service agency. And, uh, I started to work there in the summer as a speedy, you know, a student, speedy job. And, uh, it was, and speedy was for low income students. And I met some amazing leaders there. I met um, Sofia Mendoza there. I met Ernestina Garcia there. I met um, Henry Dominguez, Jesse Dominguez. I met um, Sal Candelaria. These are all the main, the hardcore leaders of our community, Chicano community. So they got hold of me, you know, and they began to mentor me and groom me to become a youth activist. And uh, so I, we all, we all became part of the junior black parades. And so we started getting involved in, uh, you know, uh, speaking up against the injustices in uh, on Storm King with um, the police brutality, because we were some of those youth. You see, I'm an activist, uh, you know, I was a young activist. I continue to be an activist, but at the same time, you know, we're young. We were young. I was only like, you know, 16, 17 years old. So, I mean, my, my life was not together. You know what I'm saying? I was out there as Dorian King trying to make a difference, but I also got hooked up into gangs and to drugs. Not wanting to, that, to live that lifestyle, but that's what us young people were attracted to because I believe because we didn't have the same opportunities that some of the other youth had, we were not selected to go to, like they said, the great, the best colleges. So because I got attracted to that and I come from a family of seven, 
my brothers got involved as well. And we were all got involved in the gang lifestyle. But we were still marching. We were still, you know, si se puede, because we still believed in the cause and we still believed that we could make a difference. I truly still was, I believe I was still a leader, but I was suffering in silence in my own personal life because I was, um, I didn't feel, I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel like I really had a purpose. But there was so many things that really um, brought me a lot of pain. So the, um, I graduate, barely graduate because that year, as I was involved in, in the gangs, I got stabbed by the same gang I was hanging out with. And they were supposed to be my homeboys, you know, and that, that really turned my life upside down mm -hmm. because it was a so, such a betrayal that it was uh, a gang that we pretty much give our lives to, not knowing what the heck we were claiming, but we were claiming it. And um, so when I got stabbed and the same gang members began to, uh, you know, and they were starting to threaten me and intimidate me and say they were going to kill me, that anger caused me to turn my life around. But I, again, I, and the bullets that were flying because it was retaliation when I, we, we got out of the gang because we, we knew we were going to die, my family. My parents were not gang members. We were involved in the gangs. The kids, you know, me and my siblings, we were involved in the gangs. The, the community members, they even came to the house and they, they were vigilantes out there, you know, Jesse and, you know, Sal and all of them were there to, to protect our family from, from the bullets. But, you know, we can't stop the bullets, you know? And as much as they loved us, it was, it was so hard to stop the violence. So um, I started to experience a spiritual search within myself, that there had to be a greater power, greater than me, that something bigger than me that could change me, could deliver me from this life because I'm dying and my family's going to die. And we're caught up with police brutality. And, you know, I'm a Chicana activist and I'm getting harassed on the streets. I'm getting slammed down every time they see me walking the streets. And I'm like, what do, I, what do we do? You know, my family got arrested all at one. In one day, my five members of my family was arrested. So we were already like targeted, you know, as bad seed in the community. And now I'm, now I'm a victim of gang violence of my own gente, you know, my own people, stabbed by the so-called homeboy, punctured my lung, you know. So I started the spiritual search, and I started to call out to, my higher power was Jesus Christ. I started calling out, call out to, is there a purpose for my life? I know you called me to do greater things, but I don't know. I don't know what to do. And so it I experienced a spiritual awakening and I got, I believe that I got called to a greater cause of helping people um, find freedom from oppression because it was then that I found freedom. I found true freedom within myself in my in spiritual enlightenment and my new life that I said, you know, I felt free that I could truly, truly help other people because now I was delivered from PCP. I was bound to PCP, animal tranquilizers. A lot, of our, a lot of our homies were all caught up into smoking PCP blast. And so now I found true freedom from that drug and from the gang of violence, the life of uh, violence. And it was then that I started my journey into inter prevention and intervention with um, students in the schools, in the East Side schools. Thank you. I started um, in the elementary schools teaching alcohol prevention to mm -hmm. kids in the Alamark School District. And then later on went into the junior highs and teaching and giving out, you know, like information, education on gangs and drugs. And then later on in my life, went into treatment programs, became a KDAC drug and alcohol counselor, received my certification by the state of California as a drug and alcohol counselor. And I celebrate 40 years of being drug free and gang free and all of that <laughs> violent lifestyle. Um, I'm today still an activist in my church. I still reach people. And I believe that it's changing a life, one life at a time. 
that's my philosophy. I touch you, you touch another person, because that's how I got reached by one person. And that's how we bring about change. It's a dom domino effect. And so I continue to work. I don't no longer live here in San Jose. I moved to Dallas, Texas, but I'm working there now with the homeless community, mental health, drug and alcohol, you know, issues, you name it, the gamut, right? Just people suffering on the streets. And so, um, yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. Great. I just want to talk about two, you know, there were like, We've all talked about a lot of defining moments uh, in all our lives, but I just talk about two quick ones. Uh, one, uh, I remember uh, in a meeting at, uh, of um, United People Arriba, guy showed up, Asian guy, Japanese guy named Norm Mineta, showed up and said, you know, um, I want you guys to support me. There's a vacancy on the city council, uh, and I want you to support me. Uh, and uh, he talked about, you know, having been in, 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 in a camp, and he talked about all that. And it was obvious to us that he really understood where we were coming from, that he really understood our lives, that he really understood our, you know, our experience. And so <clears throat> we said, of course, we're going to support you because you're just like us. Your, your people have gone through the same experiences as us. And so he said, and so he said, thank you. He said for supporting me, but I'm gonna tell you this. The first thing I'm gonna do when there's another vacancy on the city council is make sure that somebody who looks like you is there to represent you. And he said it not because you're supporting me, but because it's the right thing to do. And what happened? He got appointed. The very next vacancy that there was, Norm came to us and said, I'm supporting Al Garza. And I want you to help me get him appointed. And we did. And that's Danny's, Danny Garza's dad back there. Yeah. And Al did a great job. And, uh, you know, he still today is in the community. Uh, helping others, you know, uh, and and I wanted to share another experience that we had on the east side. Uh, you know, um, uh, back there, like in '71 and 1972, African American guy supposedly made an illegal U-turn and ended up dead. Cops killed him to death, stopped him, and he ended up getting getting killed. And so, you know, just like today, you know, so all of us organized around that, and we wanted to. Uh, demand justice, of course, didn't happen. But since then, you know, uh, things did change a little bit where the district attorney has to investigate every single police killing and so on. So we did change some things. But one of the things that we did then was we we um, wrote up a, a police review board um, uh, declaration. Uh, and, we, and we wanted to, um, you know, create a police review board. So we started to write up... Uh, uh, a ballot measure to do that. And then we realized, well, wait a minute. Uh, if the city council is going to appoint the people who sit on here, they're going to appoint nothing but cops. Yeah. Because at that time, six out of seven council people in the city of San Jose lived in Huero Glen. And so we said, wait a minute. <laughs> what we need to do is district the city council. And so instead of that, we wrote up a, a ballot measure that districted the San Jose City Council. We got to a point where we got most of the signatures and about two weeks before the deadline, Norm Mineta worked out a deal in the City Council to create a strong mayor form of government and to have districting. And so the City Council actually decided four to three to put it on the ballot. Well, after the Mercury News got through with that, a week later, one of one of the one of the four <laughs> vote yes votes changed to three, and so we were not so they decided to take that off the ballot, and so we ended up with no districting. Uh, we had Mario Bledo himself argued a case we brought in court to as a stopple to 
uh, still put it on the ballot. At the time, there were 96 Superior Court <laughs> judges. Nobody looked like any of us in this room. One woman out of 96 on the court in those days. So you could imagine what we were up against. But lastly, uh, finally, years later, we did get a measure put on the city council. And that's the reason why we have five Latinos on the city council today, because we districted the city. So yeah, it was a defining moment for us. I also want to say, out. We had we were going door to door getting oh, signatures yeah. and they threw those signatures out. Mm -hmm. So our petitions, as many signatures as we got, they threw them out. They didn't care about it. And I, of course, I was one of the ones who was going door to door. And, um, you know, it's just so important that every time that, you know, Community Alert Patrol or Confederacion saw that injustice, we were on it. We were on it. And so I appreciate the fact that, you know, we continue that legacy and that we're sharing that and that there's young people that are coming after us that are involved in doing it and, and keeping the struggle and that, that movement forward. Can I just say something? Oh, I, just, I just want to thank you both for your work because we were those youth that were getting slammed, you know, on the ground and being thrown into the paddy wagons on Story and King. They, they set a curfew. Because, you know, out there, how many remember the curfew? 12 o'clock. If you were out there on Story and King at 12 o'clock cruising or walking around, and, you know, we were out there. That's when we met everybody, you know. We got pulled into, like, thrown into paddy wagons. The other thing that they were doing is that, do you remember when they were doing that whole uh, portrayal that if you look like a gang member, they would grab us and they would put us up against the wall and they profiled us. They had a database with our names and our pictures, and all our information. Who are you? What's your name? Where do you live? Who's your parents? What tattoos do you have? We were not, you know, we were young people running around, and yet some of us were, you know, into the gangs, but not everybody was a gang member, you know, that was out there having fun, just cruising, showing their lowriders, but people were getting like profiled. That was serious to be profiled as a gang member. And the work that they did, that database got thrown out, right? Got thrown out. Yeah, that's yeah. that stopped. So thank you for that, for your work. Yeah. Definitely so many ripples of impact, right? I think in this community and also beyond. And so we see the benefit, we experience it overlapping stories. Max, I wouldn't have existed without the efforts here. I wouldn't have been able to do that work and see what the youth are doing now. So it's very, uh, the ripples are clear and direct and they're constantly overlapping in conversation with each other, right? And uh, I know we had that technological glitch at the beginning, so it's been a perpetual day of catch up. And uh, I'm gonna leave us with this final question because there's a lot to unpack with it. And a lot of you have touched on a lot of, of these um, different touch points of recollection and memory throughout the decades. And that theme of solidarity. Family, but then also organized as organizations that have impacted other people across generations. But what is your, most vivid memory of the community coming together? What is your most vivid memory of the community coming together? Well, um, for me, it was uh, the women that I was involved with. Um, we felt many times that we didn't have a voice at the table as women, okay. Latinas. Well, say this and I'll say that. And um, Ernestina Garcia, we were uh, at, uh, I lived at uh, South Tierra Nuestra, there off of Jackson, and we had a little meeting there, and um, we decided that it was important to push ourselves at the, to, to get to that table. And uh, we set up what was known at that time, uh, Mujeres de Aslan. And so it worked because they would say, oh my God, I viene las mujeres. You, you know, so they're a little bit more uh, inclusive of us. But also we, we started, we needed to um, uh, 
uh, you know, get young women involved, young Latinas involved, and we created an organization called Wahina de Paz, who got the first funding for a mentorship for Latinas in, in uh, Eastside San Jose. But I think that one of the things that I learned was through Cesar was that you have to get other people involved. They couldn't do the boycott by themselves. And you know, one of the things that I think I learned from him more than anything was to be fearless. Fearless to be on that picket line. Fearless to get arrested at Santa Clara. Fearless to not be afraid of getting thrown in that paddy wagon uh, when we were arrested at, at Harriet Park. That, that fearlessness to keep moving and struggling. And I think that the UFW also, to the question, brought us together, showed us how to become, create partnerships, create a sh showed us how to do coalitions to, you know, because the power of the people is bigger than the people in power. And so when you create that power within communities, within organizations, you have, you have that power to create that change sometimes. And they listen. And so I think that um, the fairground, when they were Chicanos fighting and everything, they called the monitors, they called the berets. We, we, we created an organization called the monitors with the, the Dominguez brothers and Sal Alvarez and I mean, Sal Candelaria. And we went out and saved lives at the, the fairgrounds, you know? We stopped fights. We, we told the kids, you know, let's, let's be peaceful. And um, so I think coalitions with like the UFW was there, the Confederacion back then. Confederacion didn't meet yearly, we met monthly. And there were 60 different organizations that were part of the Confederacion. The student organizations, all kinds of different organizations came together to meet the challenges that we Latinos were facing on the East Side. And so I think that, you know, when you bring all this together, you create more power and more power to be able to change things. Yeah, I'm happy to go because uh, Shirley taught me a lot in those days. And I certainly, I certainly got it. I remember people were talking about the women problem, and Shirley would say, "What are you talking about? You're the problem." <laughs> and she's right, and I, I learned an awful lot those days, and I uh, have always, you know, have always acted consistently with that. She's absolutely right about leaving out some of the most important folks in our lives. Um, I just want to uh, share with you one, one quick thing because, um, um, you know, organizations getting together, the Confederacion uh, started that where, uh, you know, everybody was always competing, but, but with the Confederacion, that's what it meant, Confederacion. So a lot of us uh, in different organizations joined with the Confederacion, we were able to do an awful lot of things together a lot of political things together because we work together. And one of the things that I remember uh, is that, you know, we had, we had the African-American community, Latinos, the Asian community, we all were pretty together with all our different community organizations working together uh, to change things. And one of the things I remember um, was um, Mike Honda, you know, was, um, was a mentee of, of Mineta's. And so he followed Mineta's shoes and, you know, worked closely with with Latinos and we supported him for, uh, to get on the, 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 the um, San Jose uh, 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 Unified School District Board and so on. And uh, one of the things that he did was he wanted to run for, uh, for assembly. And so uh, um, he came by my house there uh, by story uh, and, and we met, he said, you know, I, 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 I wanna meet um, this guy Bustamante, Bustamante, do you know him? And I said, no, I, I don't know him, but, but I know, you know, a, a Latina lawyer in San Diego who's on, in the assembly who knows him very well. So uh, basically, um, we, we had this experience where I got them together. And uh, then, of course, um, uh, he, ran for, he, ran, he ran for assembly. And, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so Honda got elected. And then, uh, as, as you might recall, you know, there was a question who was going to be speaker. And so... Uh, uh, of course, as usual, the LA folks who have, you know, I don't know, 50 <laughs> assembly people uh, wanted to control as they generally do because they have so many. Um, and so uh, that person ran and, 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 uh, and, and Mike ran uh, and, and, and Bustamante ran rather. And so they went around the room, you know, and Bustamante needed 15 votes in that caucus to become speaker. And they went around, he had 14 votes. 
And then they turned to Mike Honda and said, who are you voting for, buddy? And he said, Bustamante. That's how Cruz became the first Latino speaker since, you know, 1849, uh, when we had an actual Mexican speaker of the assembly, uh, when we actually had, you know, a Mexican legislature. So he became the first one. And so it was that coalition that continues to this day in San Jose uh, from those days, you know, where the Asians, the Asian community has always worked with us. That came from those days. Wow. And it was a defining moment because like I said, it still continues. Well, I guess for me, I have to piggyback on what Shirley said uh, about the problems that Chicanas had with machismo. It wasn't easy putting up and dealing with these, some of these men who felt that women did not belong at the Confederation meetings, let alone that women should be leaders. We Chicanas had the hard task of teaching our men to change. We were called names by our own Chicana men we did not understand that the power we brought to the table with decisions was just as strong. It was the mujeres de Aslan of the Confederación that were the movers and the shakers. One thing that stuck out to me uh, was when we had a blowout with the San Jose Mercury News. At that time, the, the newspaper was uh, putting uh, articles labeling uh, communities as criminals, gang members, and thugs. And so uh, the whole community came forward and they went after the uh, newspaper for that. Uh, other things that stood out to me was when we had the celebration of the 25th years of Chicano movement at the National Hispanic University in 1991, where they showed all the accomplishments of the Confederacion. Before retiring as a Chicano nurse, I worked for about 30 years, I became a I was a member of the SEIU Latino Western Division. I also have formed the Chicano Employees Group at Kaiser Richmond. I founded the Latino Health Network and was able to point out to lawmakers and congressmen Dellums in Oakland about the great discrepancies and the discrimination in the health care system, uh, especially at Kaiser Hospital. Now, I was an employee at Kaiser, and I saw a lot of things that were horrendous. My parents taught me to stay aware, aware and to be aware of the poor and the oppressed, and especially of my own kind. My mom would say, and these are her words, as long as there is a human suffering and bondage of any kind, then there is a need for revolution. And those were the words of my mother. After the passing of my mom, I had the honor to represent the National Partido La Raza Unida and spoke at various colleges. I used the name of La Chingona as I've written articles about the Mujeres de Aslan and about violence against our women. And I need appeared in Ensemblador. I'm now an elder of the Black Berets of Aslan and represent the Mujeres de Aslan. I inherited all the Chicano archives of the Confederacion of which I have given to the library. And uh, I think it's important because all this history belongs here in this area. Uh, so that's where I was at. I think an important piece I got was, uh, I, um, Sunny Madrid and, um, you know, Elena Menard and various of us that were, you know, involved in the East Side decided that we needed a new party. And so we started organizing registered people for La Razonida Party. And that was one thing I gave to the to the library was my registration uh, back then. It was a green little sheet that said I was a member of La Razonida Party. But um, if, if you read the Mercury News right after that, you probably weren't, a lot, uh, weren't born yet but it said it was an awakening giant that had opened their eyes that the Rasunida was organizing itself in the East Side. Yeah. Now I got most holy uh, Five Wounds Church, that area. And so I had to le le learn um, 
Portuguese real quick. <laughs> because <laughs> you don't know how many Portuguese register for La Racionita party. And so I think that was also an important impact that had it in our community because it also, also brought people together to talk about the political uh, disadvantages that we had. And, you know, we were making, you know, very much uh, move in, 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 in to make changes on the political uh, level. But, uh, you know, it's Tony mentioned that we were fighting that fight with, you know, Norm and, and, and Honda and other people and Blanca who joined the Board of Supervisors and, and so many others. But uh, I wanna thank you for coming and I wanna, Thank you for listening to our stories. And there's so many more. Like, I just want to let you know this. I think it's so important. You know, Angela Davis got arrested and she came to San Jose yeah. for her trial. And she wrote in her book that it was the community of Lerp Patrol that helped uh, 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 acquit her because there was not very many Blacks in San Jose. So the Chicanos took on her movement and, you know, had rallies for her on her behalf. and. You know, I hope the police aren't here, but I was at the University of Santa Clara and um, and I got sent out to graffiti the walls of Free Angela, right? And so a cop came by and, and it's like, I threw the can and then I, and then he stopped and he goes, young lady, what are you doing out here? And I started crying and I said, and, and Fran Escalante was across the street waiting to see if I was going to get arrested and put, put in the police car. And so then I said, oh, I got it. I broke up with my boyfriend and, you know, <laughs> and I'm just trying to pull him away from the sign that we just threw free Angela. And so then he goes, where are you at? I go to the University of Santa Clara. I stay at the dorms there. So he goes, we're going to take you back, young lady. He took me back to the university and then, and then, uh, then I got a call on the, the, the dorm phone. What happened? Are you there? And I go, yeah, I didn't get arrested. I, I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> always cry. <laughs> the crying yeah, always very community. The community is responsible for freeing Angela Davis, I'll tell you. Oh, wow. I want to just mention that I think um, when I think about uh, a moment, an event, a time that brought the community together, uh, as I got involved in um, doing like gang and um, drug prevention and intervention in the community, one of the opportunities that our pastor, um, Pastor Ed Morales from Victory Outreach, may he rest in peace, he's no longer with us, but he's someone that we really have to honor. He did such a tremendous, uh, amazing work in the east side of San Jose with the Duke of Earl drama. I don't know how many of you know of the Duke of Earl movie. He produced that movie. I had, he was a great visionary man. And I had the opportunity of being under his ministry for many, many years until God took him home. But he, he had this, this dream and this desire to reach, you know, the, the gang members and to go into the barrios of, of San Juan and to bring the message of hope. And he used us, a lot of us that came from that life, you know, we, we weren't acting, we, that's who we were, you know, but we throw us on the stage and, you know, we could put a little bit on it, you know, but we came together as young people and he used that drama to take it into the schools. And we worked with the community and also want to acknowledge Jerry Amato who's here. He's also a great leader and activist for many, many years. Jerry and myself, because we had the community, uh, you know, um, experience and background of community organizing and from working in so many different community-based organizations that um, we formed an organization within our, our ministry called Voices, Victory Outreach Inner City Educational Services, I think it stood for. And so we said, you know what, we got to take the Duke of Earl into the East Side Schools you know, and just tweak it a little bit so it's not religious, you know, and we, we, we get thrown out the door, you know, <laughs> and so um, we, we gave it the, got to take the right step, <laughs> you know, instead of give your life to God, it was take the right step to a better life, you know, mm -hmm. that, yeah, because we, it was a, a drama that portrayed the drug and alcohol lifestyle and the consequences of that lifestyle, and so it was powerful to take that that drama, the Duke of Earl, into, you know, the East Side schools and to work in collaboration with the schools and even the police department that was out there because they knew about, you know, the, the problem that was going on and, and it continues to go on. We've seen the gang problem 
become, you know, what it is today. We were some of the first gang members. And so I always felt that I owed my community a lot more because I was one of those young people that got drawn into that lifestyle, me and my, my brothers, and we did some damage. And we also suffered the consequences. And giving back was to now go out with that message of hope and letting other youngsters and familias, mo mothers and fathers know that, you know what, don't give up. There's hope. There's hope for your kids. And they could change. Because I changed my life. My brothers changed their lives. And we're now you know, productive members of community. We all do different things. And, and we all have our own families now. And you know, so. Um, just thinking about, you know, some of those moments of going into the comunidad with like the Duke of Earl and going, educating, you know, the schools and the students is, was I think to me, one of those moments and one of those times that I really, I'm grateful for the community and in all aspects coming together and fighting, you know, that fight against drugs and alcohol and gang violence. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. I think I'm getting the eyebrows of, of the time, right? And so I want to remind us of a few housekeeping items before we fully close off the panel and thank our speakers for all of their wisdom and story and lives of what they've done. And, you know, everything you've shared has had a ripple effect. That's a constant theme. Um, how we see ourselves, how we tell those stories, how we keep it alive, and how we also remind folks here in our home base that those stories have been alive and well and rooted us in so many beautiful legacies is important. But the housekeeping items I'm talking about, not to steal y'all's thunder, but Kathy, Shane, Estela have some things listed here in the queue that includes the ongoing exhibit of Eastside Dreams that will run. If you pick one of these up, one, it's beautiful. Two, it has all the relevant information you need. Three, there's a QR code with more goodies on there. And we have Kathy waving the off-white cream colored survey. If you could all do us a favor talking about keeping our legacies and stories alive, we really do need folks to chime in with some feedback on today's events. Because what we know from the work here is that yes, the people have power. And if we don't speak up in these official systemic voices, then the people with resources keep thinking we don't. So let's articulate that power in a way that will lead to more of this because we need it. Um, another reminder, September 3rd from 1 to 3 on the flyer, the next conversation that is uh, Impact in San Jose, a conversation with scholars. Details also on the flyer. And I think that covers the housekeeping and brings us back to the people present here today. Muchisimas gracias. Thank you so much for being the power and the voice with the people. Thank you for inviting me. I just want to say that if you're free on August the 26th, please join the farm workers of Sacramento mm. that uh, Governor Newsom signs the bill that they want to be able to have for them to have better elections. All right. Thank you so much. All right. A round of applause. It's been a pleasure. Right. Rosana Alvarez para servirles. Let's have a round of applause for the speakers. Oh, we're going to sit. <laughs> it's a photo shoot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here, sister. So I didn't get to say everything that was there, but it's okay. <laughs> sure, I see. Okay, honey. No problem. Okay. Uh, can I do this? Yeah. <laughs> can I do this? You can do that. Go ahead. This, this is for you, Mom. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Never ending. Now we're going 